OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. It's half past seven. You're very welcome along to OTBAM. As ever, Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you here until 10 this morning. If you want to get anything off your chest, you can WhatsApp us. 087-9180-180 is the number, or you can use the hashtag OTBAM. Or, of course, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment. We read all the comments, and thanks very much for getting involved. The best place to listen to us as a radio show is obviously on the new OTB Sports app, which you can get in the App Store. You just search OTB Sports and download it there, and uh, we have a full live continuous stream of uh, non-stop sports radio goodness for you. A very busy program for you. TJ Reid is going to talk to us about what it's like to be a gym owner at the moment and also what it's like to be one of the best herders in the country, and he'll give us his thoughts on the Kilkenny sporting event Rushmore, which was a complete disaster, by the way. I was on holidays. It, I wasn't here for it. it. I take no responsibility for it. It's all Owen's fault. And uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. The South Dublin Mount Rushmore is today. Some um, notable absentees would include a, a triple gold medalist, a Tour de France winner perhaps as well. Uh, we'll talk about that with um, Owen around about eight this morning and then we'll bring you our final nominees. Robbie Keane might not be on it. I'm going to tell you that now. Robbie Keane, our record goal scorer, might not make the South Dublin, let alone the Dublin one, which, um, you know, I, uh, pff, uh, what does everybody think about Robbie Keane not being on Mount Rushmore? Like on the Irish one, our record goal scorer, like not just our record goal scorer, three times more goals than the person who's next behind him in the list. Nowhere near, nowhere near the mountain. What does this say about us? Uh, answer me that. What does this say about us as a people? That we can't live with Robbie Keane? That there's something wrong with us? That we can't find an accommodation to live with Robbie Keane? Um, I don't know. Maybe they're going to put Conor, Conor McGregor on it. I don't know. Who knows who they're going to put on the Mount Rushmore this morning? We'll see. Uh, all of that coming up at around about quarter past nine. And then we'll do the actual full final Dublin one tomorrow with a, a star-studded list of guests. Uh, in the meantime, 87 9180 is the number if you want to get um, involved in that conversation or tweet us at Off The Ball. We're kicking off this morning, a great conversation here between two retired warriors at um, different stages of their careers. At this point, uh, Johnny Doyle, much longer retired from the Inter-County game than Andy Moran is. However, they were both in club GA action over the weekend, and here they are chatting with Joe yesterday about what the new normal looks like. So I have Andy at a whippersnapper, 36 years of age, and I have Johnny Doyle at 42. Is it not time to wrap it up, Johnny? I think you're done, no? <laughs> probably, probably about three years ago, but look, I suppose it gets me out of the house and um, yeah, I should, I'm just trying to keep keep in with the young lads now is a, is a challenge at the moment, but still enjoying it, I suppose, and, and the body is not, not too bad, so as long as, as long as the manager thinks I have something a little bit tougher, I'll, I'll, I'll stay at it, you know. Well, I'm sure he does. Fair play to you, still going at 42. Andy, how are things on the ground then? Protocols, no dressing rooms, the new normal has been much talked about. How was it for you guys? Yeah, I think it's a it's a bit it's it's bizarre in many ways. But then in other ways, it, it, when you get playing, it's just it, it's basically just football. And I think the move away from the kind of dressing room scenario has been coming in club football over the last couple of years. Anyway, you know, um, in, ter in terms of fellas leaving the dressing rooms, it's something that we were trying to, I, I suppose, move away from in in our club that fellas might stay around, have a sandwich, a cup of tea after the game because that had drifted away out of our club. But now it's kind of, that's what we're encouraging people to do. And it's uh, it's a bit strange, but when you get back playing, it's funny, the, the kind of normal kind of uh, scenarios kick in. And um, it was good to get moving at the weekend. Um, you're saying there to Johnny, he's 42. I was at a Valladolid Junior game on Sunday. And Aidan Higgins, that used to play for me, is 45. And he was, uh, he was playing for... Uh, who's playing for Charlestown and ruling the roost. So, Johnny, you have a couple of years left in your head, I think. <laughs> How did you get on at the weekend, Johnny? Yeah, we won. We won by a pint. Uh, did well to hold on in the end. I suppose we did. We were, we were in cruise control five minutes to go, and uh, we were fighting for five pints up, and they got a, they got a goal. We had a goal disallowed, and they got a goal a couple of pints. So we held on. We held on in the end. So glad to come away with two pints in the first round of the league, you know. And I presume there was huge interest in the area, Johnny, and you could have had way more than the 200 that showed up, or was it quiet enough? Um, no, it was, there was a bit of interest. Obviously, we, we played Cara, which would be would be a local enough club. A lot of our, our lads would have went to school in Prosperous, um, so would know a lot of the Cara guys. And um, So there was a little, obviously a little bit of interest. Um, we wouldn't have played each other too often in the past, um, but we're... Both teams find themselves at the moment we're, we're, we're in the same division. So, um, yeah, there was a good bit of interest. It was um, you got a ticket going in at the gate, and it was 
you had to queue um queue at the gate there was a line a line of cars going into the into the field um we someone collected the, the few bob and, and you got a ticket so there was a bit of interest there no i haven't heard of anybody within our club that was refused entry or turned away um you know so which mm. is which is is good but it was certainly a it was a good interest in it i'd say this time last year if both teams had played you wouldn't have had the same crowd at it i suppose maybe maybe supporters were starved of competitive football and it was a it was a lovely uh, sunny saturday evening so um it made for made for a great um ingredients for a, a, a good spectacle i suppose well the word was out johnny doyle was in the mood you know people word got around town and people <laughs> said i gotta see this i gotta see this <laughs> Joe, we're looking for the money back on the way out <laughs> <laughs> What about your neck of the woods, Andy? Were your cars similar situation? I think it is a limit of two hundred people at the moment. Were people being turned away? Was there bigger interest than usual? No, I think it was around that. Uh, I think that's so, something similar to what we might get at a club game anyway. Uh, throughout the years, um, we like we'd have a wide open field. I think there's something like eleven acres <laughs> in the in the whole kind of. Uh, surrounding of the two fields and things like that so it's very hard to keep people kind of out at the same time you know but they, in, in fairness we did it you know the, the COVID officers there they're watching people going in and out uh, the physios are outside you know so there's a lot of work being done around the club just to kind of mm. keep it kind of as safe as possible and um, I think people kind of adhere to it I think people some people are staying away as well if I'm being honest um, but um, good interest uh, our league was pulled in, in Mayo so we had a competition called the Michael Walsh uh, and Michael Walsh League so it's a, it's a bit of a, a, a kind of pre-season tournament so it was a decent game we played Davids and, uh, and it was a decent game to be honest all in all and uh, the, uh, what, what I found amazing in Mayo was that the scoring was so high like there was games where there was 420 scored and things like that so it's um, it, it's funny how it kind of works out in terms of skill level and scoring rates and little things like that but in, in terms of the, the safety and the difference it was all it was kind of all kind of well mannered and is training impacted at all Andy like in many respects if you're back you're back you know you're just going to get into tussles you're going to get into combat with people and that's just the nature of the game or are you trying to change training to make it somehow safer in, in ways like I can't quite offer up to you yeah I can't either but it's uh, that, that's the biggest contradiction that I have I, I do the coaching with the team now at the minute and uh, We'd be in the gym and we'd be like trying to keep people two meters apart. And there's 16 meters, uh, there's square meters uh, between each other, and little zones. And you're only allowed into your own zone. And then you go to training. Then on a on a Wednesday or Friday night, and you're telling fellas to be tackling. And yeah. well, you know, it's it's uh, it's a funny one. It's a funny situation. But it's um, training isn't impacted really. Uh, only that you bring your own water bottle. You're not allowed into the dressing rooms. Lads are talking out on the stand, but in terms of people go on the pitch, the lads just want to play football and kind of get onto it. It's refreshing in one way because for that hour, hour and a half, you can kind of break free of kind of the worry of COVID and mm. um, little things like that. And it's, it's it's just nice for the lads to get away from it. I'm sure it is. And how are you finding things then as you make your first foray into life away from the Mayo setup? I suspect you have incredible friendships. You know, Mayo is like a, a club team in many ways and to try and maintain those friendships and not talk about how Mayo football is going is very difficult for you at the moment. Yeah, I think Johnny Johnny probably w went through this a bit. It's uh, When you leave first, you're kind of, you're still texting the boys and you're still ringing, meeting for coffees and, uh, and you know, the normal stuff that you've always done. But then you have to realise then the loyalty of them boys now is to the, to the, to the manager, to the team and no matter who you are, I think, especially myself, I, I'm inquisitive, I like to know what's happening. I do ask the question, I do. So I've, I've moved myself away from that a, a, a tiny bit. Um, the friendships are so strong. Obviously, I met Colin Boyle at the weekend, we were playing his club. You meet Keith and you meet the boys around the place, Donald, Donald Yvonne and these guys, but you try your best to, have, um, to keep away from it and try not to kind of... I suppose put them into an awkward situation where they've played with me for 15, 16 years. Some of them over, I suppose, over the 10-year period of the last 10 years, and you just try to keep away from them questions and keep yourself out of them conversations. So it's been tough, but that's one thing that COVID has definitely helped me with in terms of the lockdown. You had no choice. You were kind of you had time to reset and time to kind of rebalance yourself. And I came out of it. I, at this stage, I have to say I'm not missing it in any way or form. You know. Oh, good. How did you find stepping away, Johnny, in that respect? Yeah, a bit like Andy, I suppose. Yeah, the hardest thing was, you know, you remove yourself from the WhatsApp group, and that's like, uh, 
you know, it's like a ball of lightning just hits you saying, you know, you're gone because inter-county football is, you, know, you are in a bubble um, and everything you do, you know, whether it's your, your family takes second, your your work takes second place, um, everything you do is, is geared around trying to, to to make a layer better and then when it's someone, it's like someone switches off a, a light switch, it's it's all over and it can be difficult and um, I suppose from my point of view, I was I was 36 when, when I finished, so I was, uh, you know, probably maybe stayed a year too long as well, but um, the fire had bur- burned out in me, you know, I was, I, the, the the lads that I had, um, Dermot Early, Ronan Sweeney, these guys had moved on and the dressing room had changed, as, as you'd expect, mm. um, and then Kieran left and, you know, I, I went back, but my heart really wasn't in it, so the time was right for me and I didn't leave with any animosity. I wasn't told to go um, and I found that was probably a bit easier because I know all, some, several players, you know, felt they had something to offer but a manager comes in and maybe they don't fit into their plans and, you know, maybe leaves a sour taste in their mouth. I got away without that which was, which I'm very grateful for and mm. um, it, it was time to go but, you know, you get back into, I suppose, civilian life as such um, and you, you just move in different circles. You, you know, you, I have a young family and, they take time, and you I got back into the club, and all of a sudden, then you're you're you're, you're spending more time with club mates and stuff like that, and you're maybe um, spending more time with with the lads that you didn't really not that, not that you ever fell out with them in any stretch, or you'd see them a lot of, but you probably just didn't mix as much. They were socializing and stuff like that that mm. you weren't, you know, you weren't you didn't go out on a Saturday night, and for now, and I even found that was a big thing. I didn't even have to look around me if I wanted to go for a pint on a Saturday night, I would go. <laughs> You know, and at 36 years of age, people think, "Geez, are you mad?" Or like, but you didn't feel guilty. You weren't, you know, and and there's little things like that. Um, I, I, I certainly didn't miss it. And you know, I would talk to go to matches and stuff like that. And you know, maybe Kaleer. It was good for my ego as well, uh, Joe, because maybe Kaleer won't go well, and they come, someone will come up to you. Oh, they still could do it with you. You know, you get that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> <laughs> you get about six months of that, and uh, it, it's gone. But look, and I, I say. Oh, when I finished, it was the right time for me to finish. And um, yes, you missed the big days in Crow Park, but did I miss the the, the, the muck and, and the slop and winter football? Absolutely no. I, I I drove by the training grounds several nights and I just got a shiver. I said, "Thank God, I'm heading for home." You know, pull into the chipper on the way home. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, your record with Kildare was obviously ridiculous in that you played 67 consecutive championship matches. It just injury seemed to be something you were able to ward off, or else your timing was good. But I was reading your Alan Wood career is fairly ridiculous as well. So your debut in 97, aged 18, I know your dad played for the club and he was chairman for a time as well. Mm. And you won the county championship for the first time in 04, which was obviously huge for the club, only founded in 1956, Alan Wood. But I was reading when a club official was saying in, in 22 years, you didn't miss a championship match for Alan Wood either. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, I, I suppose I, I made my league debut in '95. I played my, made my championship debut in '96, and I haven't missed a championship match since. Um, what's that down to? I, I, I'm not sure. I think I used to, when I was younger. You know, I came onto the Clare team. I was just barely touching ten stone, and um, very, very like no one would be let into a uh, senior intercounty dressing room now with that way. They just wouldn't be let in to be fearing for their safety. So, and you're not, um, you're, not used, you're not short either. What height are you? No, uh, uh, just about about six six one and a half. About and you were ten stone. Yeah, ten stone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, McGinney, I, I got to about just over twelve. McGinney used to say, "I can't believe you were two stone lighter." So, uh, <laughs> but look. So I'd say I, Francie I, I Bell, was, you saw you coming and said, "Come here, I'll, I'll have this twice." Yeah, too too, <laughs> too big. <laughs> um, but yeah, so but I suppose as I get on, you know, the fact that you didn't, I didn't pick up any injuries, you know. Never broke a ball, never put a hamstring, you know, just very, very lucky um, in my makeup. Yes, lots of days I went out carrying knocks and niggles, but mm. um, probably just didn't didn't advertise them, just got on with it. And I always felt, you know, adrenaline would get you through um, when you were carrying little bits and pieces. So. Did you try and put on weight, Johnny? Because I'm sure you were told to. Yeah, I did for, for a while. I did. I, um, I remember Johnny Croft brought in uh, a nutritionist, and I was there. You know, I need to, I need to get heavier. Was at that time the creatine was a big thing for intercounty footballers, and you were, you were sh- shoveling in, you were putting it on your cornflakes, never knew it was just. But I just couldn't. And Johnny brought in a nutritionist, and at the time she was working with Kenny, I think as well. And I just said to her, "Look, no matter what I eat, and I had a good appetite, you know." I got, and she said, "Maybe that's just the way you are." She said, I "Remember telling me that that." Um, 
um, what's his name? Com- Andy, or not Andy Comfort. Um, Martin Comfort, in, in, he was the very same, mm. you know, and they called him Corte, you know. <laughs> um, but it, he just he just couldn't put it on. And, and he said, maybe just time to stop, stop worrying about it and just get on. You're obviously able to hold your own and, and mm. don't. And it was probably good advice, you know, I just got on with it. Even, you know, while I did get a bit stronger, obviously, with, with weights, the longer, you know, weights were becoming more and more. Um, I never really, really put on huge bulk, but... Um, Probably with age, you got a bit stronger and stuff like that. Um, but you know, just I, I stopped worrying about it. To be honest mm. with you, John, I just I said just get on with it. There you go, Andy. Everyone's cursing him. He can't put on weight and just you know <laughs> didn't miss a game, did his thing. You were kind of the opposite. I, I always suspected you were very uh, hardworking, diligent in the gym, and obviously you had your fair share of injuries as well. So you were almost opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah, I was opposite in, in terms of putting on weight as well. To be honest with you. <laughs> I'd uh, I'd still have that issue, but um, yeah, I was kind of like the injuries kind of only kind of hit me when I was about 27, and then I kind of went on a run of three or four injuries. But I know it sounds daft because they were significant injuries in terms of breaking a leg, cruciate, lower back issues. But after that, like either side of that, I actually had a really clean run. Right. And yeah, I, and I know that sounds daft. No, I get what you mean. Yeah, when it was so, bad, it was very bad. Yeah, it, yeah. So I had three years, four years there of really bad stuff. But it, either side was it was it was good and very very rarely missed games as well. Played a lot of games in that period where I literally wasn't fit. I was playing 70 percent. So things like that. But Johnny, like I think he's hit the nail on the head there in terms of that nutritionist just goes, listen, you seem to be able to hold your own here. John, don't be trying to change it. I think everyone has tried to change everything in the game at the minute. Everyone has tried to look for that little thing that's going to make a difference to the likes of a Johnny Doyle and say, I did that for them and I did this for them. Mm. Like, Johnny Doyle was scoring, sorry now for talking about you like this, but Johnny, you like you were scoring like in 2004, 5, 6, you were always scoring points, always one of the highest scorers in the championship when you got a run at it. So I think people are too eager to change body type, body shape, speed, power, positions, everything, where sometimes you just need to look at your strengths and kind of develop them. So it was a really good bit of advice, I would say, that the... The, the nutritionist gave him, and I would say the same about myself. When I actually, and you've probably heard me saying this before, when I actually got out of my own way and stopped trying to change everything about myself and just kind of worked on the things I was decent at, mm. all of a sudden it, it, it took hold, you know? Am I right in saying, Johnny, you ran a marathon last October as well? Yeah, I ran a marathon in October, yeah. Yeah, a few of us, a um, few of my buddies from, from home decided, and we were, we were down in the local one night, and I got to talking about doing it that never did any running and he was saying he was back running I said yes we should do the marathon and I got a phone call he said the next morning I said do you realise we're after signing up for the marathon last night I said yes did we so <laughs> on we went and we did it yeah so I'd say you're it's made for strange. that I'd say you're made for that you look like like long distance running you'd you'd find easy no yeah we, yeah I, I would definitely would like I suppose it, it would have you know I said you, you weren't looking around a heavy weight it made, it made things easier I mean, you know I would have come in started with Mick Dwyer and obviously Mick was famous for his for his laps and um you know that was sure that was was easy stuff for me at that time you know per glen ryan down the him. back absolutely or, or he, you know I, I don't know how them boys did it because <laughs> Mikko had this thing about you know we'd start and we'd do 10 laps and then we'll change it tonight and we'll go 10 laps the other way and stuff like that which was <laughs> you know it's mad stuff but it made no difference to me but you know and you'd have like you'd have some lads at the opposite end of the scale or but he used to call them the fatties you know we get yeah. We get the fatties to do a few extra, you know. So after doing 20 laps and lads struggling, and I'd barely be the sweat going off me. <laughs> he'd send maybe he'd send Carol and and uh, Brian Murphy and these guys around for another couple of laps just to, to make them sweat a bit more, which was. And we'd be tapping away at the ball at the goals, and I don't know how to do that. And before I let you go. We had, we had planned really just to have a club chat and see how things went that, that opening weekend, but just by coincidence, we have two of the best inside forwards uh, that we've seen over the last 20 years. Obviously, the position changed a lot over time. Can you give us a sense, Andy, of how your game might have changed? Um, and, and, and both of you take this the right way. I would see you as both players who got better with age, you know, I mean, kept improving, kept having bigger effects on, on games, and you're a footballer of the year, what, in your, in your early to mid-30s, Andy. Uh, I would think you, I think darting runs all the time, all action. Uh, give us your sense of the, of the position and how it did change. Yeah, I, th- I think it's uh, it's one of the uh, positions that fascinates me because when people talk about 
football being in a bad state. Like I look at Bernard Brogan, Conor McManus, Kieran Donny, Gooch, all these guys who like Conor Callan now, Joe Kelly and all these fellas who just Joe, you know, I think we're seeing Clifford, like we're seeing some of the best players that have played the game over the last Joe, you know, 20, 30 years. And sometimes when people say, um, Joe, you know, that the game is in a I, I'm saying, are you watching the same game as I'm watching, really? Do you know? Mm. Um, but how the position has changed, I think the evolution of the sweeper and maybe the double sweeper, all of a sudden, the element of speed that was in the game. So if you were really corner, fast corner forward and you were quicker than your corner back and there was no protection there and you take your man on or you go to you know, win the ball, you're going to win that race. It's as simple as that. That's just the speed of it. But now all of a sudden there's a sweeper in, just say the Donegal team of 2012 where you, you had a Mark McHugh always kind of defending from the, the strong side. Now all of a sudden you have to come up with a different way of winning the ball. That's either coming on the loop or it's a double run or a treble run and little things like that. And I, I think it just kind of, it, it just it just moves slightly with that. We had, in North 6, we had Donaghy going along with the ball and taking out the sweeper. And then all of a sudden, you just teams playing it into channels, looking for different ways around it. So you're saying that me and Johnny got a bit better. We probably thought a tiny bit more about the game in terms of how we can get there. Like, particularly for myself, I was a slower player, I didn't have much speed, so I had to kind of think how best could we get the ball, who's on the ball, where are they going to kick it, and I think that's the way it's changed slightly. Um, mm. But you, you, you look at some of the best players, and I mentioned that Tony Ball team, and you mentioned McFadden, who was electric in 2012. You look at the playmakers outside him, you had a Lacey uh, at number set, uh, like War Six, played five really, you had a Mark McHugh, and you obviously had a Murphy at times outside him as well giving them in that good ball too. So it depends how you play the team. A lot of teams then play with three running halfbacks. If you play with that, you know, how do you want your forwards to be moving? And it kind of, it's all kind of systems based now and it, it, it depends how you kind of view the game and how the manager views the game and where do they want you to play. Mm. What was your experience, Johnny? Yeah, well, I, obviously I'd be, I'd be somewhat similar to Andy. You know, I probably, I probably spent maybe as much time in the half forward line as I did um, as I did in the full forward line, and mm. um, I'm laughing at Andy's head. He was slow. Just, if he was slow, <laughs> it doesn't need much time, much for me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it, I'd be very much like Andy. You know, like you'd be. I think the game is always evolving, and you know, obviously now there's so much analyst of the analyzing of the games. Every team has a full time analyst in. They're looking. The game hasn't changed. You know, you look at your strengths. What's your strengths? You look at the opposition strengths, where can we nullify them? You know, and there's loads and loads of examples of that. You know, Andy mentioned Kieran Donahue. You know, Kerry, Kerry didn't come to say, well, we're going to, um, you know, rewrite the book here and let's see, do something different. They saw a big guy at six foot five and a great ball winner and probably a very selfless player in the fact that the first thing he, he did when he when he won the ball was to see, can I get it to the to the main man around me? Um which often left him with more space maybe than, and, and he, he was able to capitalise that on that himself. But, you know, first time he'd he come to ground, he's looking to slip slip it to the good. So that's, I don't is that is that rewriting the game of Gaelic football? No, to me it's not. It's it's about what what asset do we have here and how best we can utilise them. Yeah. You know, Mayo... Have we lost you there? You gone, Johnny, or are you back? Might be just gone. But just to go on, on, on Johnny's point there, Joe, the, um, like, it, it, it's the big one is that they're, they're just playing to the the fo like to the players you have at your disposal, playing to their strengths. And mm. I, I think that's the I think that's the key point, and I think that's the key point Johnny was trying to make, and it's a point that I I totally agree with. Like if you see, um, so if you looked at the Mayo team that I was part of. Like, if I was expected to run after the cornerback, the likes of Philly McMahon and Johnny Cooper and these guys running up the field. I would, Mark O'Shea, you know, and these guys, there's no way I would have been able to do that. So Jason Doherty, who was like a dream to play with, like he used to protect me in that way so I could stay further up the field, you know. So mm. it's all about just kind of management systems, putting the systems in right, or putting the right system in place for your players to kind of develop in that similar to a Johnny, similar to a Johnny Doyle and, and things like that. And I think that's the, that, that's the key thing. And is, has the inside forward place changed? slightly in the way you have to move but the, the guys who are confident enough to stay in their position stay inside the 21 stay in, closer to the goal and i probably developed that later in my career but 
the likes of the Gooch and these guys who could have had their whole career, Werner Brogan and these guys, they just, you know, that's, I think that's the key kind of confidence to have to, to, to stay high up the field. It's funny, Colin Cooper was in here a couple of years ago and I asked him what was the most important thing about playing the position when he was in that inside forward line position and he said patience patience and confidence to go 20 minutes in a game without touching it you know can you hold your nerve and you've, you've taken the words right out of his mouth there uh, final one because I know you've got to go so you're back open for business I know you've gone out on your own now and things seem to be going very well I mean geez beautiful timing of a pandemic as you're trying to get it all off the ground uh, we, we, what's the state of play at the moment ah oh, yeah we're good we've got our um, we've got the three places back open it's it's um like the amount of demand for it is 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 unreal. Like so, we we all thought we were going to go online and yeah, like we kind of seen what you did with all kind of sports stories and things like that. We thought we were all going to go online and that we'd have to kind of push out. But the amount of people who want social interaction and don't need it in a safe and safe environment is mm. is massive. And like we 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 do our classes and our class were 100 percent capacity there for about two three weeks now. They're calming down now, but. Really in a kind of controlled environment, people staying in kind of their own zone, wiping down their equipment as the you know, as they use, and little mm. things like that. Just it's different. But the key thing for us is that the, everyone is back at work. The three places are back open, and Joe, you know, we just kind of need to bring it forward, kind of in as safely as we can for kind of staff and our members. Good. Well, listen, best to look with it. So, look, Johnny Doyle has put in everybody to shame at 42 years of age, trotting around, marathons, never missing a game. Are you going to still be playing club action for Balahadrine into your 40s? What's the plan? How's the body? Ah, the body is is only middling, if I'm being honest. I, right. I, I tried to do that run and crack uh, during the pandemic, you know. I tried to... We, we did this challenge where, in the gym where we did 10Ks for 10 days in a row. Oof. Like, I was at about day six, you know, and, like, I, I, I was struggling. But we got through it. Um, do I say I like it? No, I don't want to. I won't be running at yeah. anytime, anytime soon. Played the game against Davids on Saturday. Sunday was a, an interesting day as well. But <laughs> no, t this year was supposed to be my last year playing for the club. But right. you know, it, it's a, it's a six weeks turnaround, and we, we might we might give it one more next year. We'll see how we go. But um, all depending on how the the family and the, the kids and all that are going on and, and work and little things like that. And I really want to get into the kind of coaching side of it as well. So kind of try to develop that and the same thing. If I can do both together, I'll play. But if I can't, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, you know? OK, good man. You're keeping busy. Listen, thanks so much for the time. I know you're running to do a class as we speak. So Andy Morn of Balahadreen, uh, very much. Thanks a million, Andy. And thanks to Johnny Doyle as well of Alan Wood. Cheers, fellas. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. OTB Gold, the very best of off the ball. Are you crazy? This is OTB Sports Radio. This week on OTB Gold. The art of, be of beating people is obviously you've got to have a trick, we know that, and it's got to work. Absolutely brilliant manoeuvre by Mansell, fantastically brilliant. But I never even wanted to see those people, you know. I went into isolation for many years. Schmidt was there the last time. Oh. They could learn to calm it down a little bit, and everyone else could as well. Jack McCaffrey, you're very welcome. You just warned me, no boring questions. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long day. OTB Gold, the very best of off the ball. Weekdays from 1pm and 6pm. This is OTB Sports Radio, live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. 7.59 a.m. this morning. You're very welcome along to OTB AM. It's Jerry Gilroy and Owen Sheehan with you all the way through until 10. If you want to get anything off your chest, if you want to give us some abuse, if you want to be nice to us, 87 180 180 Owen, good morning to you. Good morning, Jerry. How are you? Good. How are you is the, is the question. How is the Aston Villa fan in all of OTB AM's viewers' lives? Like It, it did feel that there was a, an air of resignation pretty much since August, that no, you were getting no, relegated. No, And then all of a sudden, no. look where you are now. When, whenever we beat Everton that Monday night, or was it a Friday night? Whenever that was, when there was fans there and Villa Park was on fire, I was like, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. And then it was like, stop signing players, stop changing the team, what are you doing? And then when there was no fans, I felt like there was no chance. And then their performances have been fairly inept. They didn't have the best lockdown. It's fair to say that Jack Grealish has not come back uh, as dominant and as clued in a footballer as he was beforehand. Um, 
I'm not going to lie, I didn't watch the game last night. I, I was like, we went 1-0, I was like, I'm not going. I'm, and so I actually, I went to bed and every 15 minutes or so I would go, Alexa, what's the score? And she would be like, in the uh, Premier League tonight, it is Aston Villa 1, Everton, uh, Aston Villa 1, Arsenal 0, with 74 minutes gone. I'm like, oh shit, this can't happen. And then eventually it was like 92 minutes, 90, 90 minutes plus three minutes stoppage time. I'm like, oh, maybe it's going to happen. What are you going to so I'm trying to remain calm because there's still a million different ways that Aston Villa can screw this up. A million, a one really, but a million, it feels like. I love how last night kind of uh, the discourse changed to how Watford have somehow screwed this up. How whatever they did on Sunday is responsible for what we're looking at at the bottom of the table right now. As if Nigel Pearson staying at the club would have stopped them getting spanked by Manchester City and stopped uh, Aston Villa beating Arsenal last night. So if you're looking for a million ways to screw something up, at least there are a million different reasons why Watford are being blamed for how they're screwing things up. And I think all the neutrals are now on your side. That's for sure. People want Villa to stay up. People want Watford to go down. It's as simple as that. It's exactly what the Pozzo family deserve for sacking Nigel Pearson, even though it's actually going to make no difference. Spoiler, they're still, they still could possibly lose two games, even if they had Nigel Pearson in tow, and Villa might have stayed up anyway. Uh, but th that, that's what I found one of the more amusing angles around last night. You didn't miss much, to be honest, after you went to sleep? Like, in terms oh, of... I wasn't asleep. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't Sorry, watch. I just couldn't you were, watch. You were talking to Alexa. You were, you, you, you were talking to, to, your, to, your, to your robot in your room, which is fair enough. But, uh, like, Villa should have won the game 2-0 potentially 3-0. There was, I know this is not about Arsenal whatsoever, but I saw an astonishing statistic last night when it comes to Arsenal putting teams under pressure. It was from Daniel Storey. He says, no player has created more chances in the league for Arsenal under Mikel Arteta than Mesut Ozil. The last time Mesut Ozil played was on the 7th of March. Wow. They are second bottom, not second bottom, they're 16th, I should say, uh, in terms of chances created in the Premier League this season with 288 just uh, two less chances created than Watford all season. This has been the big issue with Arsenal, not having a playmaker. And I think there was a, a certain level of surprise that they'd managed to create a few openings in their last three games, three, four games. Uh, but basically, my point is that as an Aston Villa fan last night, there wasn't a whole pile of nervy moments because Arsenal actually couldn't really carve out a single opening, it's to be quite honest with you. 17 games at Villa Park since Villa last beat Arsenal. And bear in mind, Villa were down for a couple of seasons. So that's a long time. That might be, that might be like pre-millennial. Mm. It's potentially, it, maybe it isn't, but it could be like, it could be 01 or 02. It's around then anyway. It's a long time ago. Yeah. So long when you say ago. nothing to worry about, Owen, I'm sorry. The last time that I actually remember Villa beating Arsenal, you're far too young to remember this, but on Saturday afternoons, there used to be live football on Sports Stadium and it would be on tape delay. And you would start the game, I think, at maybe 3.15 or maybe 3.30, depending on, I don't know exactly what, what the stuff was. But Andy Townsend was playing for Villa, and the delay in the actual match was so long that the tape delay somehow managed to catch up. I think we subsequently learned that somebody had um, lost a, a tape and the, the time telescope, so we were actually watching it essentially live. And uh, Andy Townsend scored seven minutes into stoppage time to win the game 3-2 for Villa. Actually, it couldn't have been Villa Park because we were in the green jerseys. Uh, at the Muller, the Muller, and it was like, ah. That's like the last time that I remember Villa being good enough to beat Arsenal. You don't, a need long to time. Be, you don't need to be amazing to beat Arsenal these days. And also when you've got something to fight for. And also when you've got Jack Grealish. Who... 21 years. Okay, it's 21, 21 years. years. Yeah. Yeah, so that is 99. Uh, like, your point on Jack Grealish is definitely true. But last night, he looked excellent. He looked really, really good. Now, I know Arsenal have a knack of uh, getting the best out of opposition players sometimes. And uh, Jack Grealish is the exact sort of player that might thrive uh, against uh, that sort of midfield that Arsenal fields its and continued field. But he looked exceptional last night, and he is the best player involved in the relegation scrap at the moment. So that surely gives a lot of hope. And I, I did like uh, in his post-match interview, Patrick Davidson is basically like, you don't have to answer this. You, you don't have to talk about the fact that you might be leaving the club, but what's the story? Are you going to leave? And uh, Jack Grealish stepped on up and actually answered the question. And he was like, you know, I'm not too sure at the moment. Uh, I have one aim, and that's to keep Aston Villa in the Premier League. That's a yes. And I'm like, that's a, exactly. Come on, I'm that's like, a yes. You had, you had the option. If you're not to too sure, nothing. you know exactly. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. And look, the reporter gave you an out, literally gave it to you on a silver platter, and you were like, nah, I will not take that option to say nothing. I will say something because I want to not be an Aston Villa player in two weeks' time. So uh, Villa are playing West Ham next Sunday, and obviously West Ham are safe, and so you would hope have been on the complete tear, the absolute batter ever since. That's my... Yeah, they're not, they're not fully safe yet, though, are they? Like, it's a uh, uh, oh, they are. miracle. They are. Well, they, 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 I mean, sorry, Watford would need to beat whoever they're playing by 14 goals. So, I mean, that's mm. possible. Things, strange things have happened in North Korean leagues. Um, are, are, are they not 100% safe? They are, aren't they? And no, to... they're not. They're not. Like, I mean, they're playing Ma- Ma- Manchester United tonight. So, can Manchester United dig into the 14 goals uh, in some manner for Watford? They're like, they're three points out of the relegation zone. So, they're not mathematically safe. But in practice, that, that 14 goal turnaround isn't going to happen. <laughs> I, I would be amazed if it happened, in, especially when Villa is one of the teams that they have to play. Um, and so obviously, they haven't been on the latch, basically. Uh, and so I'm just trying to see who are Watford playing. Oh, they're at Arsenal. Yeah. So uh, you can count on Arsenal not doing you a favour. Yeah. But uh, like the thing is, West Ham could could get a point uh, against United tonight, and that will keep them safe. And then they will be on the lash quite late in the week, which is exactly what you want. A good Wednesday night session to carry them into the weekend, and that's Villa will probably beat them. Like also as well, like I mean, we're forgetting the whole Pozzo family and sacking Nigel Pearson and whatever whatever's happened there. I think Villa staying up is is good for everybody in general. Like. I, there's a bit of history there's a bit of narrative there it's a good club with a big fan base with Leeds coming back into the Premier League the league is getting stronger in terms of hashtag narrative next year it's just a better league with Villa and, Le- and Leeds in it than say Watford and Bournemouth well it's potentially West Brom coming up too so there'll be middle West- derbies for them uh, them Wolves and um, Villa suddenly playing each other at least I don't know how good West Brom and Villa are going to be next season but certainly if there are fans at matches, the uh, games will be slightly better. And, you know, Birmingham is a huge industrial centre for uh, England and should actually have uh, their biggest club in the Premier League just for, like, economic reasons alone. It's a big, big market. So um, so that was, uh, that was Villa last night. If there are any Villa fans out there who want to share their fears about the next week and how, how difficult it's going to be to watch that game, then uh, get in touch. 0879-180-180 is the number. The um, South Dublin Mount Rushmore, there was a... It's fair to say that the North Dublin selection process was not as straightforward as we had anticipated it when our guests simply refused to play along, which was fair enough. Uh, our agenda is, is pretty clear. We're, we're splittists at heart. Uh, how did the South Dublin one go? What's gonna ha- what, what can we expect? We can expect more embracing of the fact that Dublin just needs to be split up. It's as simple as that. Stephen Doyle and Phil Egan have waved the white flag of surrender and are already building a wall around their brand new South Dublin uh, sports municipal stadium right now. So they they played ball, it's fair to say. They picked their four, and it's a strong mountain. Is it stronger than the North Dublin mountain? I think it actually might be. And, and you know, maybe it's because we didn't get a, a true, passionate appeal from the people of North Dublin over the last couple of days. But I think the South Dublin mountain may be a tad better. Is it posh? No. Not at all. Right. Not at all, actually. There is, uh, like, so you've got, there'll, there'll be a footballer, there will be a GEA representative, there will be a boxing representative, and uh, there will be one other representative that I can't quite think of right now. A runner. Uh, on, a runner. And, uh, and a runner. So no cyclist. Uh, no cyclist. No swimmer. No. no swimmer. Like, astonishing, really. If you, like, if you look at it statistically, how is there not a swimmer? On the South Dublin Mount Rushmore. Well, Gary O'Toole would have been on the on the Wicklow one. That's the that's why he was he was ineligible for it. And Ronnie Delaney, is he the runner? Oh no, wait, he's on the Wicklow one as well. I do yeah, like these but, counties that kind of creep in and just steal from other like down stealing George Best. Going yeah, we love we love George Best. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so uh, so Stephen Roach is is uh, one of those people who w- wasn't properly discussed. I believe is that is that is it true that you just did, like. A world championship, a Giro, and and a Tour de France in the same year, like literally one of the greatest sporting achievements that it's possible to do. even if even if everybody had a, a motor to travel that far on a bike and have, do it in a shorter time. Like I'm not saying that they did have motors, uh, but even if everybody had been on a motor, just to stay upright. 
to win yeah, those three uh, events. Like, this is anti your anti-cycling agenda is coming to the fore here again. And what about the snooker player? The snooker, sorry, it's it's not a runner who's the who's the, the final cont contender. I don't want to give anything away. But what? Hey, McCoughlin didn't make it. Jared, there's there's a certain golfer that uh, you may be forgetting about as well. There is like who cannot not make it. So you Fair got. Enough. Like, I'm telling you, this South Dublin Mount Rushmore is ridiculous. To even be in contention uh, is, uh, you, you've got to put in something extraordinary. Like, I mean, the, maybe there's an anti-cycling agenda. You're going to have to take that up with our South Side uh, selectors later on. I am a mere conduit in the conversation when we get into it later on. It's all on the shoulders of uh, Stephen Doyle and Phil to actually insert uh, Stephen Roach into the conversation. Um, it, it didn't necessarily happen. And, uh, like, Ken Doherty... Uh, is tougher probably go going to be on the outside looking in. See, Robbie so Keane. The, the, Robbie Keane makes it hundred percent. He's he's the footballer because he's the greatest footballer in terms of like achievements at international level that we've ever had. He, he scores a goal that rescues an entire World Cup campaign. Imagine if we hadn't got out of the group, the the vitriol that there would have been against Mick McCarthy after Saipan. He puts the show the on his little tallow shoulders. Does the cartwheel? <laughs> That's a there, dagger to the heart of history. All right, it, it, but, you screwed it up, Owen. It's fine. It's fine. It's not the first time. Uh, TJ, but, uh, T, TJ Reed is on later on, right? I, I hope you apologise for the Kilkenny Farago. Uh, yeah, we did. I, I'm not going to lie. I basically did. So I, uh, we're we're going to get his take later on on the the Kilkenny Mount Rushmore. Not not so much the the Farago because I, I want to maintain a little bit of self respect, but. Henry Shefflin versus DJ Carey. Why is the versus? That, 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 both. Stick them both on. Take them both on. That's it. You just go, no, uh, I'm making an executive decision. They're both on. Anyway, we're too late. 12 minutes past eight. You can, you can do your toadying up. You can lick his boots a little bit later on. That's TJ Reid coming your way at around about 8.40 this morning. <laughs> and South Dublin Mount Rushmore a little bit after that. Um, a reminder, OTBAM is live in association with Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. Shane is with us now. On uh, Good morning to you. From the wilds of Monaghan, how are you? You're on mute there. No, oh, we're not hearing any of Shane. The wilds of Monaghan, a dangerous place indeed for um, the the aural sensation of uh, Shane Hannan in the morning. Just w one quick one, just for uh, while we're trying to re-establish him, I just need to lay out the contenders for the footballers in South Dublin since you ha had a go at me there over Robbie Keane. It's Robbie Keane, Damien Duff, Kevin Moran and Paul McGrath. So don't come at me with your Robbie Keane narrative if he doesn't make it. Those are the three contenders, especially Moran and McGrath, deserve to be there ahead of them. Right, you just went in with your, with your eyes closed. That was it. Fair enough. No Robbie Keane. Shane, how are you? Ah, he was there. What so am I, Marcus? <laughs> He's Marcel Marceauing from Monaghan. Here, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll come back to you in, in just a moment. Here's what's uh, coming up on the show for you today. As we've said, um, we're going to talk Premier League with Stephen Doyle in just a moment. Um, obviously, talking about the uh, game last night with um, Villa and Watford, both on 34 points. Villa's slightly better goal difference by a single goal. It is remarkable at the end of the season that it's coming down to this. And then obviously we'll talk about the top four as well because um, those decisions are still to be made. Uh, we had the very latest on the All-Ireland Football League. We're going to talk about that. Uh, TJ Reid, who is entering the stage of his career where he could really be spoken about in the same tones as... Eddie Kerr and Henry Shefflin and DJ Carey and then uh, South Dublin Mount Rushmore. We had um, Andy Moran on a little bit earlier on. He was speaking with Joe um, from last night about the surge in people actually wanting to go out and socialise in gym classes. And that's great to hear because it was a real concern that gyms were going to be one of those, um, just those organisations that would find it very difficult to rebound from uh, the crisis and it seems and it, when he said it it makes a lot of sense like a lot of people got into very good habits they don't want those habits to go it's actually much easier to do it in a group so uh, how's TJ Reid finding life? Yeah he's uh, finding life pretty good he, he's got a lot of space he says in his facility in Kilkenny like he would have opened up a second gym in Salt Hill at the start of this year as well so that probably wasn't the best timing in the world but what has been good timing is that I don't know, he was well placed to take advantage of the opportunities that actually came from the pandemic, the exercising from home. Like he certainly comes across to me as the, the Joe Wicks of Ireland over the past few months. He was doing 
PE classes online essentially with a heavy dose of GEA thrown in. So people were working on their skills and kids were working on their fitness twice a week, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. He said the reach was incredible. He said people from all around the world were getting in touch to say that their kids had been partaking in these classes. There was uh, kids doing push-ups, but more importantly, there was kids actually who had uh, things to do during the day when school wasn't on and they they couldn't see their friends. And like, in fairness, you don't want to overstate things, but what a great service that was. Yeah, give them a medal. If we if we like, had like a presidential seal of approval, you'd be giving it to the TJ Reeds of the world who are helping people to distract their children for five minutes at least. <laughs> yeah, it's it's true, and like kind of allied to that then is the fact that TJ Reeds gym was where he often did his uh, web sessions from. So that was good for the brand. Like so, it's a, a symbiotic thing that people were getting some great stuff off his free Facebook lives twice a week. Uh, and also his brand is being improved. So there is a man who's definitely had his head well screwed on when it comes to the pandemic and to how he can make this the best possible case scenario for yeah. him. But on a purely practical level, he says he's got a massive place. So All he right. can social distance away. That's uh, coming your way at around about 8.40, 8.50 this, evening, this, uh, this morning. rather. It is 16 minutes past 8. We can go back to uh, Monaghan. Shane, how are you? Not too bad, lads. Hopefully you can hear me okay this ah, time. Ah, it's perfect. You plugged it in. You turned it on, you turned it off again. <laughs> can you hear me okay? We can. Loud and clear. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, no, I was, I was just basically saying that I was very happy for you, Jer, as an Aston Villa fan. I know there are a few of my mates that are, well, one of my mates who's an Aston Villa fan, who's also delighted this morning. A bit older than you, I would suspect, if he's a Villa fan, or else he just is a glutton for punishment. Yeah, he's he's in his early 40s. So uh, he was he was, he was was around for that time of uh, great Villa achievements. And uh, it's good to see. I think uh, Owen mentioned it as well. He's kind of read the room that a lot of people now want Watford to go down, given what they've done to Nigel Pearson. And look, we have Conor Howrahan to think of here as well. We have an Irish player for Villa. So more Irish players in the Premier League, the better. Yeah. And Jack Grealish, of course. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, what, what a great team we would have had if uh, Jack Grealish and, and Rice had been capped at some point. Anyway, let's move on. Don't mention the war, Shane. Don't mention the war. What have we got for us? <laughs> yeah, we'll kick off with uh, that Aston Villa result from last night. They are spending their first morning out of the Premier League's bottom three for the first time since February. A third goal in as many games from Trezeguet gave the Birmingham side a 1-0 win at home to Arsenal last night. Defeat means Arsenal need to win the FA Cup if they are to return to Europe. They're currently in 10th position in the Premier League standings. Watford goalkeeper Ben Foster, meanwhile, says a lack of confidence has seen them tumble into the relegation zone. They fell to a 4-0 loss at home to Manchester City with Raheem Sterling scoring twice. This all means the battle against the drop will go down to the final day this Sunday. Villa star Jack Grealish knows his team need to give it one more push. But, you know, all we can do is focus on ourselves. Um, you know, I think uh, the ball's in our hand now. So, um, you know, it's up to us to what we do on the last day. But nothing's done yet. Um, you know, we have a massive game now, uh, Sunday against West Ham. And um, we'll be giving it our all again. Big night for Liverpool fans as well. They'll finally get their hands on the Premier League trophy tonight for the first time in 30 years. Club legend Kenny Dalglish will help with the presentation on the cop. That all follows Liverpool's game with the Chelsea side still chasing Champions League football. Kick-off in that game at Anfield is at a quarter past eight tonight. Uh, before that, Manchester United continue their own push for a top four place. They welcome West Ham to Old Trafford from six. United were dumped out of the FA Cup by Chelsea on Sunday, but United boss Ole Gunnar Solskjaer insists they still have plenty to be positive about. We stick together. We've done fantastic to get this far. Give us this chance to go into the last two games with the faith in our own hand. Uh, Destiny is in, in our own, uh, or legs, if you, if you like. All the build-up and live scores to both of those games tonight. You can follow all live on the OTB Sports app, which you can download for free right now with the App Store or the Play Store. Promises to be a dramatic night of action in the Championship as well tonight as the second-tier season draws to a close. West Brom know a win against Queen's Park Rangers will ensure they gain automatic promotion to the Premier League. If they lose... Brentford could overtake them with victory over strugglers Barnsley. Fulham are also in the hunt ahead of their final match at Wigan. The hosts aren't safe from relegation due to the threat of a 12-point deduction for going into administration. Bottom team Hull can still avoid the drop in their clash with playoff hopefuls Cardiff, while Luton will aim to do likewise when they face Blackburn. Of the sides just outside those bottom three, Charlton play at Champions Leeds, Birmingham take on Derby and Middlesbrough make the trip to Sheffield Wednesday. Swansea head to Reading with hopes of taking the final spot in the top six while Nottingham Forest will remain in the playoffs with a point against Stoke. Elsewhere, Millwall meet Huddersfield 
and there's Bristol City versus Preston. Uh, some rugby this morning. South African rugby chief Jury, Jury Roo has hinted at major changes potentially coming the way of the Pro 14. It has been rumoured that the Southern Kings and the Cheetahs will be replaced by South Africa's Super Rugby contingent, and Roo says they're a long way down the road in assessing their options. Uh, the European Tour returns to the UK today for the first time since the coronavirus outbreak struck. No fans will be allowed at Close House Golf Club in Newcastle for the British Masters to help protect against COVID-19. Lee Westwood is hosting the event on his home course. Uh, Celtic ended their pre-season trip to France with a 4-0 friendly defeat by Paris Saint-Germain at the Parc des Princes. Kylian Mbappé, Neymar, Ander Herrera and Pablo Sarabia scoring the goals in that game. Celtic have already had a 2-1 defeat to Lyon and a 1-0 draw with Nice in the Veolia Trophy tournament. In the Lennon side kick off their attempts to win their 10th successive Premiership title at home to Hamilton. That is on August 2nd. And finally for me this morning, lads, an eight race card at Ballon Robe this afternoon with the first off at one o'clock. There's also eight races down for decision at Nace. First going to post there at a quarter to five. Good stuff, Shane. Thanks very much for that. Um, uh, the Liverpool players have picked a Coldplay song, Owen. That's right up your street, right? Oh, I heard the uh, kind of, what do you call it? The sound check yesterday. Sounds uh, uh, appropriately horrific. A sky it's, full uh, of stars. Yeah. <laughs> Um, like I mean, it's it's good good for them, I guess. Like I why I, why, I don't I don't understand. Um, the, 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 I guess I just had so long to actually get the head together and pick a song. Like just don't overthink it. And when you've actually put it out there that you've come together to make a decision, then you suddenly put pressure on yourself. People will judge you for the song that you pick. At least in any other trophy presentation anywhere else, you can say, well, the stadium announcers just have really really <clears throat> terrible taste in music. But in this case, we're blaming you, Liverpool fans. Get your act together. All right. Uh, tonight, it's Liverpool against Chelsea at 8.15. Nathan Murphy and Brian Kerr on commentary duty for you. You can get it uh, live on the OTB Sports app. Uh, this is going to include the trophy presentation at the COP, which somebody said was going to cost more than a million quid, but there's been no um, corroboration for that. But hey, look, the story is out there now, and so therefore uh, people are being forced to talk about it. Stephen Doyle, good morning to you. How are you? Oh, no. Is there an issue with Stephen's sound here as well? We'll get to him in uh, just a second. Pat Fennell going to join us in about uh, eight minutes' time to talk to us about the potential for an All-Ireland League. Uh, we'll get to that in a couple of minutes' time, but Stephen is there. Stephen, good morning to you. Good morning, Ger. Morning, Owen. So our Villa staying up? Yeah, um, it did look like it did us a couple of weeks ago, but um, I think um, it's looking pretty likely they will now. Um, just look at the, the last round of fixtures there. Um, Watford's gone away to Arsenal. Uh, it's like to be honest, I, I actually thought I saw a few people um, on social media last night saying that they didn't think Arsenal were at the races last night. I thought Arsenal gave it a go. Um, so whether whether they will give it another go for another game against Watford, it's, it's a local derby. Their two training grounds are actually I've been out there in Hertfordshire. Their two training grounds are right beside each other. I'm sure there's a bit of rivalry there and, and Arsenal won't want to lose to them on their last day of the season. I know they're not um, playing in front of the home supporters, but still, um, they want to finish off on a high note. And especially, you don't want to be going into that FA Cup final in bad form. They, they'll want to go in off the back of a good result. So I think Arsenal will give it a go. So that's not good for Watford, um, who, who will need to at least win the game. And um, as for Aston Villa going to West Ham... Uh, West Ham are a tricky opposition over the last couple of weeks and I think they'll be a tricky opposition for Manchester United tonight. So I wouldn't say that's exactly... Um, I don't think uh, West Ham are going to roll over either for Aston Villa, even though it is the last game of the season and West Ham essentially don't need anything, even if they lose tonight. Um, they should be still OK just by virtue of the goal difference. Um, but um, I thought last night's game was interesting. Um, I've seen... Arsenal over a couple of games. Myself and Brian did the the Brian Kerr did the North London derby a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I thought the interesting thing about Arsenal was that um, against the the teams, the, the two big results they got in recent weeks were against Manchester City and Liverpool. And the two interesting defeats we've seen were against Aston Villa and Tottenham. And Aston Villa and Tottenham really sat in against Arsenal and made Arsenal come at them and they had to attack and try and um, unlock their defences. And they weren't able to do that. Whereas against Manchester City and Liverpool, two sides that went and attacked them, they were able to hit them on the break. And that's how they won those games. Um, so you'd have to say fair play to Dean Smith and perhaps to John Terry as well. I don't know how much um, um, the uh, the darling of Chelsea has to do with uh, tactics around Aston Villa, but they, they played that game really well last night. And 
I, I thought they were toast a few weeks back. I thought they looked a bit... They did, yeah. Yeah, they, did, they just didn't look like a team that were fighting or willing to put the fight in. And they certainly looked like that last night. And Jack Grealish, who I've been critical of, <clears throat> I think he's a frustrating player to watch at times. I, I, you know, I keep hearing people saying that he's the most fouled player in the Premier League. Well, he's the most fouled player, player in the Premier League because he would be knocked over by a feather. But... I thought last night he did. He put in a really good shift. He got back and he worked hard with his defence, and um, he nearly set up a second goal, um, which Keenan Davis should have put out, put away. Mm. And I'm sure Dean Smith will have a word w- with him about that. But um, well done Aston Villa, and I think they've given themselves a really fighting chance of staying up. And as you both were talking about earlier on, I think it's important to have a club like Aston Villa in the Premier League. They're a massive club, you know, um, massive stadium, big fan base. A bit like Leeds United as well. It's great to have Leeds back. Um, I'm hoping the uh, the, the teenage uh, football supporter in me is hoping for a 90s revival and hopefully see Nottingham Forest come back through through the playoffs as well. But um, yeah, look, congratulations, Aston Villa. I think it's uh, it's looking likely they're going to stay up. No chickens being counted here. I've got to say. Um, what about Manchester <laughs> United? Uh, Holy Gunnar Solskjaer. It's in our own legs. He said, you know, proving that you can you can live in Manchester for as long as you want, but. Um, you're still going to mangle the language from time to time. <laughs> he's um, he's doing well, I think, with the media stuff. I think he's doing well in, in how he kind of bats away the tough questions he was asked last week. I, I spoke to you guys last week about the FFP stuff and he just said he wasn't interested in, in discussing it. Um, the David De, De Gea stuff, he's, he's, um, he's not really dealing with or tackling. Um, so... Oh, Manchester United, yeah, that's that's a massive disappointment for them to uh, to not get into the FA Cup final. Um, they would have liked the trophy, I'm sure, at the end of the season. Um, I think uh, it's it's weird with United because when they go really badly, you know, everybody's in with the brick bats against against Solskjaer, and then when everything's going really well, they're getting praised to to the nines. And I think um, you know we need to find a bit of middle ground here with Manchester United when we assess them at the end of the season. Um, I think it's crucial that they get into the Champions League. I don't think it's any way a gimme that they'll they'll qualify through the Europa League because, of course, they're they're playing LASK before they then face Wolves in the semi final. And I, I I wouldn't be I wouldn't be putting um, I wouldn't be backing United against Wolves in that game. And it's um, it's not exactly guaranteed they get through the, in the Premier League as well in the top four. That's a tough game against West Ham tonight. David Moyes going to Old Trafford. I think he's going to want a result. And as I've said, you know, West Ham are playing well. They've got some tricky players up front. I think Mikel Antonio, if he plays as the, the leading centre forward behind the, the attacking three, I think he'll give Harry Maguire and Victor Lindelof a hard time. We, Victor Lindelof struggled with uh, five foot eight, five foot nine, Michael Obafemi. So up against Mikel Antonio, it's going to be interesting. And they've got some other good players, Jared Bowen on the, the right wing as well, who they brought in from Hull City. In January, he, he could be worth up to £25 million, pound, that transfer in the end. But he's going to be hard hard for them to handle as well, depending who they play at left back, because we know they've got problems there with injuries and stuff. So um, I think there's going to be a, uh, I think West Ham are going to go and try and get a result tonight. And I don't think uh, it's going to be interesting to see how United react to uh, that poor result at the weekend and whether Sergio Romero will be, will be starting goal as well. Mm. Um, I think he'll be a little bit annoyed that he was their cup goalkeeper for the whole season. And then he was dropped for the semi-final at the weekend. I think he'd be unhappy about that. Perhaps might have a point to prove then. And um, so yeah, it'll be interesting if if he drops. Listen, if I was only going to Solskjaer at this stage, and look, there's so much media attention around him. I I think it's a I think maybe it's a little bit on. Unf- I think it's a bit over the top. Perhaps I think maybe people are going in a little bit too hard. But maybe it's time for Solskjaer just to say to the hey, look, take holiday. You know, go away for the rest of the season and and come back. Um, refreshed. Sergio Romero isn't too bad of a goalkeeper, is he? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think it's um, it's a it's a high wire act that he's got to get right because if he gets it wrong, that asset has, has disappeared. And if he gets it right, then suddenly they'll be able to sell him um, at some point down the line, or maybe he, he gets back to the type of form that uh, suggests that he's worth persisting with. One last uh, point for you. I want to talk about briefly about James McCarthy? You've been keeping an eye on him recently. Mm. Yeah, very impressed. And uh, I know Brian Kerr was very impressed last week as well. We covered that uh, Manchester United Crystal Palace game down at Selhurst Park. And look, he um, he's broken the 30 appearance mark this season. It's the first time since uh, in five seasons he's done that. Um, the last time was with Everton. He made 34 appearances. So he's up to 32. I know 
not every single one has been a start. He's he's been used, uh, you know, not too often by Roy Hodgson. Or sorry, regards to full ninety minute appearances, but you could like, understand that because of the amount of injuries that he's had. Over. He, he had that knee injury and the hamstring injury a couple of seasons ago, and of course, then that double leg fracture, that horrific uh, leg injury he got um, when at, when at Everton. And Roy Hodgson took a chance on him during the summer. He said, look, he wanted it. Bring him to Crystal Palace. He felt he, there was still a good player there that he could work with. And I think he was the best manager maybe that James McCarthy could find at this moment in time. Um, I know from interviewing the likes of Stephen Kelly and Damien Duff when they were playing for Hodgson at Fulham, they said he's probably the best coach that they play for, like a, somebody who has just a football coach. So I think somebody like that for <clears throat> James McCarthy at this stage in his career is, is just perfect. But um, the couple of games I've watched him in against Manchester United particularly, I thought he was he was really good. He he's one of those players that you know he gets. Uh, some players are, are or some supporters can be critical because he's not that kind of flash midfielder that you'll see, um, you know, popping up in game and coming up with fancy assists and that kind of stuff. He's just one of those kind of grafters in midfield. He's very good at tackling, winning back possession from opposition teams, and then releasing another teammate from midfield, who then will generate the attack. Um, and Stephen Kenny has spoken highly of him in recent weeks. Um, I did an interview with James McCarthy after they played against Leicester City um, for off the ball last November and he was quite reluctant at that stage to talk about coming back to play for Ireland but that was understandable. Yeah. He, I've seen in recent interviews he said he's superstitious so he was you know, reluctant to I suppose talk about it while he was still trying to get back to full fitness. He's there now, he's already said himself, he's hinted at coming back to play for Ireland. I think he could be a, I, he's 29 years of age I, he's at the peak of his, his um, playing powers for a midfielder. I think he could be a really key player for Stephen Kenny, whether he plays a midfield three or a midfield two, a double pivot. I think uh, James McCarthy is going to be a really important player for us. And I, I think uh, it's good news for Ireland that he's back playing well for Crystal Palace. Stephen, good stuff. Thanks very much for that. That's uh, Stephen Doyle, one of our Premier League commentators. That game tonight, where Liverpool will be officially handed the trophy, is live on Off the Ball. Brian Kerr alongside Nathan Murphy. Kickoff is at 8.15. You can get it on the OTB Sports app. A reminder, OTB AM, live in association with Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette made of what matters. Now, the big story in Irish football over the last, essentially the last six months or so, has been the potential for an All-Ireland League. And I'm delighted to say we have Pat Fenlon, the general manager of Linfield, with us this morning to talk to us about it. Pat, we could think of nobody better placed who understands the, the dynamics of what's going on here than you to speak to at the moment. Um, the, the news came through that... Two separate letters have been sent, one from the League of Ireland clubs and one from 10 of the 12 uh, Irish League clubs, at least asking UEFA to examine the possibility of this happening, which seems like a bit of a breakthrough in, in some ways, but we don't want to count our chickens yet. This is a long way to go. What's your take on where we are at the moment? Yeah, listen, I think it's, it's, there's been a lot of discussions around a lot of work that's gone into it. Um, obviously, I'm working for a club in, in Northern Ireland and, you know, my personal opinion at the moment is that, you know, it, it would be good, you know, to explore this. And I think that's all there is. I think what the clubs have signed up to is to explore the potential, you know, in relation to finances and sporting advantages of how this proposal could be taken forward. And that's all there is. I mean, it's not a sign up to guarantee that you, you, you want to do do anything. We've got to find out how far we can take it. And is there a, is there a will and a, and a help, you know, uh, from your wife to try make something like this happen? I think... Initially, there was when it was discussed, one of the major pitfalls or downfalls, you want to call it, was that European positions could be lost. I think Hypercubes, uh, one of their proposals sort of does away with that, you know, where the league can stay and be played in both separate jurisdictions and then obviously a, a King of the Island competition, which sort of, you know, allays the fears of, of, of the bigger clubs, let's say, in regard to European qualification and the money that goes with that. Now, there's obviously... You know, some fears from the smaller clubs. But again, that's outlined in the letter that, that, all, that all has to be looked at and taken into account. I, that seems to be the the, um, the bit that actually allowed the breakthrough to happen. Where, And it, it, to be honest, it's very promising. Where a situation is presented, feedback is given, and a compromise is reached. It's exactly how something like this should work. Absolutely. And I've said from the very start of this, listen, this is a discussion. This is, you know, to the people that are governing the game on both ends of the island here, this is about trying to enhance the game and make the game better. Not anything else. You know, I think so, you know, personalities and personal positions have got to be put aside. This is how we develop the game, you know, on the island of Ireland. And, you know, I think that should be explored 
to the fullest part. And if UEFA, who are the governing body, you know, can row in behind that and give us, whether it's financial support, whatever the case may be, that's got to be looked at. I mean, that can only be healthy for the game. Can I ask you what the what the internal debates are like? What what are the, the conversations you're having? <laughs> Listen, I think you know it's no secret to say this will be a, a major debate at the club that I that I work for. You know that that's that's you know that goes without saying. It'll be a very robust debate. I would think at boardroom level, and probably a very robust debate if we have to take it to our members, which we would have to do if if, if it was to go forward. So. But again, it's about discussion. It's about moving on. It's about what's best for Linfield. You know, there'll be fears with Northern Irish clubs. I would think in relation to being maybe not as strong as some of the Southern clubs. But my own personal opinion on that is the club Linfield is as big as any of the clubs down south and potentially bigger. You know, so it's how we recognise that potential and fulfil that potential. And this is probably a way to help us to do that. So I'm sure it will be a robust debate. But I think it'll be honest and frank debate. And hopefully. Hopefully, we get to the position where we can have that debate and try to take the game forward. Because I think it's important that the, the, the biggest clubs in the Irish league, um, you, yourselves amongst them, are actually certainly willing to listen to what's going on and uh, and come on with that sense that maybe maybe there is a, a different way of doing things that would actually benefit grassroots football, which would in turn will increase the number of fans coming through the turnstiles, and then you get bigger games and potentially more sponsorship and TV deal. That's that's the the dream scenario here. It is, yeah, and it has to be. That has to be the full debate. It's not just about the the, the Irish league clubs or the League of Ireland clubs. It's about football in general and how this could could help all uh, strands of football in both countries. You know, so that that's a, that's a massive you know discussion that has to be had. But at the moment, you know, both leagues are suffering. You know, we don't have any real revenue. You know, we're relying on gate receipts, which is probably the only league in Europe that I think would do that. You know, so there has to be discussion. We're not getting that at the moment, so we've nothing to lose. You know, there has to be a realization. From both associations now to say it's not working, the clubs are not happy with it. You know we have to look at a different option. You know, and I think that's what both associations have to take on board. Again, like you said, self-preservation is not not up here. It's about how we how we develop the game. You know, and any aspects of that and anything anything that's brought forward, I think, should be discussed. And when we get to a point to make a decision, that will be the club's decisions. Pardon my ignorance here. I don't know what the official formal relationship between the clubs and the IFA is in Northern Ireland. Hmm. Do they license the league? Is it exactly the same as it is in, in the no, South? Well, we have a different government. We, we have Niffle who, who, who run the game in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, and obviously the IFA oversee football in, in, in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, so it's a little bit different to, 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 to the Southern League where the FAI have full jurisdiction over it. So it is a, a, lift, a, a different setup, but we, we have the same problems. You know, we have the same problems. We have a situation at the moment where we don't know in relation to football uh, in the north of Ireland whether that's when it's going to come back. You know, we have a situation obviously with COVID 19 where a lot of the clubs are struggling. We're going to have major issues around facilities and dressing rooms, you know, and yet our association in the north of Ireland have taken in something like. I think between four and five million from FIFA and UEFA, and not one penny of that will be given towards, you know, helping the clubs get through the crisis. So, like all them things have to, you know, be put aside, and we have to we have to look at it and see how do you benefit the game. And at the end of the discussion, the discussion is that listen, it's not going to make it better. There's not enough finances. In it. That's fine, but at least have that discussion and, and bring it to its conclusion, and then make a decision. Can I just ask? Because the, the ten clubs signed this letter, is that is yes. that correct? And, and when did that letter has that letter been sent to UEFA? As far as you well, know, we, or what's that we, process? The, the letter went to the OFA, and that's the process we've got to go through. So we've requested that the OFA send it on to UEFA. Okay. And do you have any idea? I, I assume they'll just do that. That that that'll be a, a rubber stamp from them that they they can't kind of say no, we we disagree with this, so we're not sending it, can they? They can do. I suppose it's like anything. They can send it on, or they don't have to send it on. But we we would hope that you know the ten ten clubs out of twelve have sent that letter, and I think that's strong enough to say, listen, we want to explore the, the possibilities. And um, we'd we'll be very disappointed if that didn't happen. Okay. In terms of the future pitfalls, like who needs to be convinced the most? Say you wave come back and say, okay, we like what you've done there. We understand that the two leagues will still be independent for mm -hmm. long enough, and the points will yeah. still count at the end of the year. And essentially. It's a cross-border competition at the end for a title, which is, you know, which is is exciting and novel. And you would hope that there's all sorts of reasons that they could um, see it working. At that point, if 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 they get that far, what's the next potential pitfall? I think that the, I think the big thing for this to convince to convince clubs to take this forward is always financial. You know, at the moment, both 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 uh, leagues 
we struggle financially. We don't have proper TV deals. We don't have proper sponsorship deals that you know allow the clubs to, to, to have real genuine income like a lot of clubs around Europe. So I think from the very start of this, this has always been a case that finance is going to be the big, big question at the end of this. And that, that again, is... is is, is a question for the people that are, that are looking to, to develop this scenario. You know, what are the finances behind it? You know, are you UEFA in a position to maybe financially get behind it? So I think I think the big pitfall, if you're asking me, is probably what is the financial deal? What's it going to be when, when all this discussion is at the end? And if, if that's something that is substantial, well, then I think you can take it forward. If it's not, then I, I, I don't think it, 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 will, it will wash with the clubs, to be honest. And Pat, is your sense that within the ranks of the IFA or with teams and clubs in Northern Ireland, is there a sense that what's happened recently in the FAI is a, is a further stumbling block, that if you are talking about the positives needing to be based on finances, well, the FAI haven't exactly been in rude financial health over the last little while? No, absolutely. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's well known in, in, in the north of Ireland as well, the financial difficulties that the FAI have got themselves into over the last few years. You hope, we're, hope, we're all hoping that's changing. And we know there's a lot of debate and discussion going on at the moment. So I hope when we come out on the right side of that, the, the association is governed properly and run properly. And um, you know, it, it, it's 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 like I said, it's we there is opposition to it. I mean, the UFA have come out on a couple of occasions now and said that you know it can't happen. They don't want it to happen. And um, but f- but for me, you know, that's not acceptable. And because if you're governing the game, you've got to look at how you develop the game. You know, and whatever potential is there to develop the game, you've, you've got to you've got to take that as far as you can. Like I said, discussions. You know, no one gets hurt in a discussion. You bring it forward to the conclusion, and then you make a decision. But like I said, this will be all around. The reason this is happening is because the clubs are struggling financially. You know, like I said before, just there, we, we've had no, you know, had no help in relation to to since the game has stopped with, with in, in regard to COVID-19. You know, it's all financial, and that's the one thing that will bring this to the proper conclusion for us is, is there going to be a deal to be done that will help the clubs prosper? And that's all the clubs. That's not just, you know, the bigger clubs as such. That's all the clubs through, through all the leagues within, within uh, both jurisdictions. Okay. Is, is there... Uh, sorry, just one, uh, sorry, Jerry, just one more, uh, Pat. Is there any sense of uh, worry or maybe even paranoia uh, in the, within the IFA or within the clubs again, uh, that this is just a stepping stone, that there will be more discussions about bringing North and South together with kind of uh, a more concrete league or potentially a team way down the line? Or, or what's your sense on that? Yeah, I, I think that, 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 that would be a genuine concern. I think that's something that has been discussed at the start of this. And we've all heard that in the early discussions. You know, if it's one league, does it have to be one Ireland? Does it have to be one national team? Does it have to be one association? But I think the game is moving. I think you'll see, you know, across Europe, this may happen in in in, in some different jurisdictions, not just in on the island of Ireland. I think if you look at a lot of the, the smaller leagues and the likes of Belgium and Holland, and you know, the bigger leagues are, are going forward. European football is developing. It will become a leap for me in relation to the Europa League and the Champions League. It's how we find a niche then for the smaller clubs to be able to financially survive. You know, so I think there'll be much more open discussion around this going forward. Yeah, Belgium and Holland joining together would be great because no one's going to start saying suddenly, well, you can't have a Belgian national team, you can't have a, a Netherlands national team. Obviously, it's a slightly more complicated uh, situation on our, on our island, but not that much more complicated. You know, it's pretty easy to work that out. Pat, it sounds like you're relatively, I don't want to say hopeful, but um, <laughs> at, at least there's like a, a potential. This is, you know, Listen, my, my, my hope is on the basis that I want the game to develop. I, I don't want to see a situation what we have at the moment. Facilities are really... Po- I've been, you know, banging this drum for a long, long time and sometimes you get fed up listening to yourself. But I just see. I just think that if you're if you're running the game in, in a jurisdiction, you have to take it to the final conclusion to see how you can develop that and make it better. And that's all we're asking here is let's talk, let's see how far we get, let's see is the resources there. And don't forget, if there's more resources there for the top end of the game, that obviously then releases more resources for the for the for the the other end of the game through the association. So it should be discussed as far as it can be. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, I, I hope you don't get tired of the sound of your own voice because <laughs> you're, you're going to end up being one of these people who everybody turns to and says, "Well, what do you think?" Because you understand it better than most people. Um, so I, I'd say keep keep talking because it's great to hear. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate that. It's Pat Fellin there uh, with a very unique view. He's obviously the general manager at Linfield and somebody steeped in. Uh, the League of Ireland, both as one of our best ever players and an unbelievably successful manager in his time as well, clearly backing the idea of an All-Ireland League and at least having the conversations, um, although I think it's clear as well from what he's saying that there's plenty for them to get through. Uh, right, so time for the papers.
OTB AM. Ah, really um, beautiful photographs of Charlie O'Leary watching Jack Charlton's funeral from his home. Um, Charlie's 94 or 96. He was on um, Team 33 at uh, last Friday with Enda Call. So you should subscribe to the Football Show podcast. Um, wherever you get your podcast, the best place is the OTP Sports app, and you'll get those pictures. So that's the front page of a lot of the newspapers this morning. The back page of the Irish Independent this morning for you. A limit of 200 fans is a joke, says Breffney boss Mikey Graham. As we've established now, it's not Mikey Graham from Boyzone. Uh, Solskjaer to make Colin De Gea, apparently, ahead of the game tonight. Galway will be non-runner without crowds, says Walsh. Not literally a non-runner. Um, and to see the business I spent three years building go up in a heartbeat was very tough. That's TJ Reid. We're going to hear from TJ Reid in just a moment. So uh, TJ Reid is in all the papers. And those Charlie O'Leary pictures are on the back. That's him there in the corner of the star. And uh, heart of Jackie's army. Thousands line Irish streets to thank football teams for the Walkinstown roundabout. So synonymous with the madness of uh, 1990 was, um, was there as well. Stay at home. Klopp urges fans to keep away as Poole prepare to celebrate. Uh, one last lash for Jack is the front of the Herald. Um, pictures of um, celebrating Villa players after their 1-0 win on the backs of all the English uh, papers down to the wire is the headline in that one. The Guardians is battling Villa, put Watford in drop zone. And uh, Chilla is the back page on the Sun. Villa wins, spooks relegation rivals and furious Foster slams scared Hornets flops. So Ben Foster not happy with his team. Thanks for being you, Jack, is their front page cover. Tears as Ireland legend Charlton is laid to rest. Picture of Jack Charlton with uh, a pint. Um, the Racing Post back page, party time. It's ahead of the Liverpool game tonight. And their front page is Siskin has to improve as scary rivals await in Sussex, says Lyons. So Ger Lyons, who's riding the crest of a wave at the moment, is there. The, uh, what's this, the Telegraph? picture of celebrating Villa players top flight survival battle goes to the wire again it is absolutely remarkable that a single goal separates the teams at the end of the season that is one of the strengths of the Premier League is that um, certainly at the bottom of the table the teams end up fairly similar in standards and it does tend to be this close sometimes at the top as well a life well lived as nation's champion in two countries that's Mary Hannigan's nice piece about Jack Charlton Solskjaer refuses to confirm the Hale will start Klopp hails the achievement of Liverpool's world leader so it's preview there and uh, talk about hockey because um Chloe Watkins was out doing media yesterday. Great interview with her last night with Joe as well. All Ireland League, not for the purest, but motivation is clear money. Um, and the, the leagues need money. They are not going to survive without it. So uh, the examiner, with um, two separate pieces about um, the examiner's new arrangement to stream Cork uh, GA matches. O'Donovan believes club game and intercounty can coexist. That's at the announcement of the partnership yesterday between the examiner and obviously they've got a lot of stuff on Jack Charlton's funeral there as well. And the star have a Leeds poster, which, you know, I'm not really sure what to, there are that many Leeds fans, but they also have this picture of Jack Charlton in full full kit. I think it's clearly at, uh, at the training ground, so it might have been one of those days where the team gathered for a photograph and he looks resplendent in lily white. It's a, a cool poster that I'm sure it's going to end up on uh, many walls. It might even end up on the wall here. And the mirror for you this morning, zeros and villains. And then Jurgen Klopp lifting the trophy will cap one of the biggest football stories ever. But then here, the opposite to Mikey Graham's story, where the cabin manager saying it's ridiculous he can't have 500 people in a ground, shut it down. This is a top medic in the back of the mail saying, GA return, not worth the risk. So, you know, he pays your money, he takes your choice. Are you going with the... Um, president of the GAA, uh, John Horan, and he was backed up by Tracy Kennedy yesterday and he's backed up by Mikey Graham today. So, uh, you know, a panoply of voices within the GAA saying, let us have our 500. But uh, UCC infectious disease ecologist, Professor Jared Colleen, warned last night it was inevitable the GAA would be faced with a COVID-19 crisis. We have to start looking at things and ask how do we eliminate risk and there's only one way to do that. If you add up football and hurling matches, house parties and pubs, you add all that stuff up together, a lot of those low risks add up to a lot of high risk. This is interesting. Uh, there's no need to single out the GEA. It's just when you add them up all together, it's asking for trouble. The question has to be asked, is this worth the risk? And are people really enjoying their bit of GEA as much as they thought they would? Someone picking up COVID-19 playing sport will not be a surprise. As soon as people went back training, the alarm bells were going inside my head. I think we need to take stock. 
And so this um, stat has been pushed out. Uh, scientific findings suggest it's 19 times less likely to be transmitted outdoors. And then he says, mm, OK, one nineteenth of a big number is still a big number. If you've got thousands of GAA players out shoulder to shoulder, that's a big number. It never made sense. I think people have enough common sense to put two and two together. What do you think of this, Owen? It's not a bad point, and you'd always uh, be inclined to agree with somebody like Professor Jared Killeen there, somebody with his expertise, as opposed to someone like Mickey Graham. Now, you can appreciate where the GEA people are coming from, but I'm starting to get a little bit weary of this, and it's starting to get a little bit annoying at this point that this is being pushed, this envelope is being pushed so hard over the last little while. We get it. John Horn has made his case clear. He wants the Taunish and Taoiseach to overturn their decision to bring 500 people to outdoor sporting events before August 10th. But it's not going to happen. You listen to Professor Jared Killeen there saying that not only do we not need to have 500 people at games, even with 200 people, there is still a, a danger here. There is still a massive danger here. We've had clubs pulling out of championships. We've got a, a, a situation in Tyrone at the moment where both clubs are, are being tested for COVID because of uh, a player who played in the match at the weekend testing positive. This, and I appreciate if I've kind of sounded a different tune on this in previous weeks, but this is not the time to be saying we need 500 people at ground. This is the time to be thankful for what we have in terms of sport at the moment and just crossing your fingers that the whole thing doesn't get taken away. You've got something good in club football at the moment. The fact that you've got a big stadium in Breckney Park, like big whoop, who cares? Not every uh, club game is going to take place in Breckney Park. Not every uh, place is going to have a, a capacity of 24,000. We can't be making a special case for big games in Cavan GEA when the national health advice is to the opposite. When you've got a professor in the Irish Daily Mail this morning saying that the sport itself possibly shouldn't even be happening. So it's starting to get a little bit annoying at this point that inter-county managers are, are coming out, that club managers are coming out, that even the, the top tier of the GEA are coming out and saying, we want more. Take what you've got. We know that the financial implications are, dev are devastating and are going to continue to, to be devastating. And we don't know how long this thing is going to last. But I'm sorry, and I, I, I will bow to the knowledge of Colleen here and actually say to myself, Jesus, this thing may not actually go on that much longer rather than thinking to myself, give us more, give us more people through the gates. Well, it's funny that there was a large coterie of people who were like, blow it up, ref, the season's over. This was in March and May. No, no, GA at all this year. And then a little bit comes back and it's like, no, we want more. Give us more now. Like this more might be coming in a couple of weeks. They might say in a couple of weeks, That's yeah, okay, thing. no problems. Like th this, this is not a, a permanent thing where people have been shut out of the GA forever. This is until the 10th of August. Like maybe you'll get your, your people and then like j just relax and, and play by the rules until then. Don't be trying to, to, to grab a, a situation, a more advantageous situation for your gate receipts at the moment when the national advice is that it isn't safe. And this line, like Mickey Graham says there, and I, like I, I, he is by far not the only person who's come out and said this. It's just that he's in the, the papers today. But he's come out and said, GEA have been very good during this. The GEA have done very, very well during this. Like, who cares? Who cares what people have done well? Who cares what credit you've got in the bank? It's about the here and the now and treating this thing day by day. If you're the most exemplary student in the class, you can still fail an exam tomorrow and it'll cost lives in this particular case. So I don't care how good the GEA have been. Uh, on a national level, I don't care how good the government have been. It's about how you handle the next few days. The past is done and you can't do anything about that. And fair play to the GEA for doing so well and having such a vital part in the community. But I think the Jets need to be cooled considerably until August 10th. Because the, the difference between 200 and 500 is actually not going to change the course of the future for a couple of weeks. Right, on oh, good stuff. Um, Got to tell you about uh, what's coming up next. TJ Reid and the South Dublin Mount Rushmore are on the way. If you want to get in touch, 087 9180 180 is the number. Don't forget to download the OTB Sports app. You can get good quality stories, you can get video, you can get podcasts. You can get a full-time radio station. OTV Sports Radio is a full hour, full 24 hours a day broadcasting all of our live stuff and all of our best of as well uh, from the past. And um, as Owen said, for the future too. At 8.54 this morning, a reminder, OTBM is live in association with Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. TJ Reid is next. Okay, so TJ Reid this week was launching AIB's The Toughest Summer. 
a documentary which will tell the story of the summer of 2020, which saw an unprecedented halt for the Gaelic Games. The series is made up of five webisodes, as well as a full-length feature documentary to air on RTE1 on August 25th. Now, TJ features in the first webisode that will be available on AIB's YouTube channel this Thursday. TJ, you're very welcome. How are you getting on? Slay it. Uh, it seems that you've become the Joe Wicks of Ireland over the past three months. Yeah, um, I was compared to him, yeah. And, <laughs> um, and when I was doing the classes, um, obviously you can see the comments rolling in and, and then they'd be commenting saying, oh, your classes are way tougher than Joe Wicks. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, look, it was a bit of banter, um, a bit of crack as well. But yeah, no, I was, I was very much... Um, compared to Joe Wicks, but, um, but yeah, I don't think I'll have the same following as Joe Wicks, though. It wasn't a bad following you got, though. Uh, like you, I, I saw you talking about the figures uh, last month or, or the month before, and it seemed the reach you got was incredible. Yeah, no, look, it, it, it was. It's very positive. Um, yeah, you know, great engagement from the kids and parents all over Ireland and across, um, across the world as well. There was, there was people in New York, Dubai, um, Texas, um, joining the, the classes. So, yeah, look, it was um, a great response, you know. I wasn't expecting it, you know. I was just doing this, um, just doing this for that, keep that connection between um, the the gym itself, um, you know, ha having a good PR, um, PR availability to it. So, but yeah, look, the response I got was, 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 was unreal. And, um, and, you know, the kids logging on, every Tuesday and Thursday and they're they're very much excited about it. Um that, that was the only excitement that they had um on a normal basis. So for me just to give my my time, give my effort and give my energy was was very uh, awarding. Uh, for people who didn't see it, it was essentially PE combined with GAA skills twice a week. Yeah, yeah. So look, you know, obviously <clears throat> hurling for myself, training was stopped and you know, I was out puffing in, in the back garden myself um, just one day, and that's where I started as, as a four, uh, four or five years of age. And, you know, obviously, i seen Joe Wicks with the PE. Um, I'd be fairly competitive. So um, I said, look, um, you know, I just, I just have, have the, um, a notion myself, wouldn't it be great to, um, to combine PE and J skills together and into one? Because for me, at that age, you know, I wasn't going to get much traction for kids doing doing burpees or doing jumping jacks. So I knew if I incorporated the GA side of it and the skills side of it and combined two of them together, that I'd, I'd connect with an awful lot more um, more kids around Ireland, um, which I did. So it was just a combination of cardio, <clears throat> some strength work, and then your basic, um, your basic GA skills. Um, but the weather, again, the weather was, was very much on my side. Um, because kids could, could could go outside and, and strike the ball off the, the wall or the rebounder, so um, which was great. It was great for me because you know when you just when you're trying to work inside in a small area, you're you only work you only looking at a few exercises to keep the kids occupied. So yeah. every week I was looking at new exercises. Okay, what can I do to to keep the keep the kids coming back and to, to keep them engaged? But um, but you know that the feedback I got. You know, press ups was the hardest, and you know, I, I had kids who were the first day only they, they could only do four or five, and then but in the three months they could do fifteen, twenty press ups. So you know, that was obviously when you when you when you see that being written back to you, it gives you great confidence that look you've done something good for the kids. Oh, without question, I'd say it's unbelievable for for the kids like who were bored out of their tree for a lot of the lockdown and having this avenue to actually play football or hurling or whatever, despite the fact that they couldn't get access to their GA pitch. So it was an incredible thing you did during the, the few months. And the way you talked there, it just strikes me how so much has changed in the world over the last couple of decades. But one thing that hasn't changed in sport is the basic element of practicing your skills. A wall is still one of the most vital tools you could possibly have as a young hurler or footballer. Yeah, look, you have to... Do when people ask well, Kenny or myself, you know, what what do you do, you know, and and, and we, we we always tell them it's the basic skills, you know, and when you're going, being asked to go train a club or train a county, you know, they're they're thinking that you're going to come with these amazing drills and amazing training sessions, but realistically, 
if you don't have the basics right, well then there's no point um, over complicating things. And you know, as a kid growing up, it's about practicing and it's about repetition, 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 and that's raising the ball, striking the ball off off your left and right, catching the ball. Like the basic skill in in GA or in hurling is is catching the ball. And, you know, if you if you go 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 into a match and you're dropping the ball. And then you're giving your opponent um, that that split second to to get up and your up onto your backside. So it's very much the basics. Um, so that's where the PE and GA skills was was just basic skills, fun, and you know obviously over we had three months. I thought it was only going to be be three three or four weeks, but you know all the kids developed. They all got stronger. We've all seen um, a few little muscles coming coming developing. Um, so all the parents were texting me and the kids were sending letters saying that, that they've improved their fitness, they've improved their strength and they've, they've improved their striking off their left and right. So for me, you know, that's, it's the basic, basic, basic um, skills to give them because there's no point in overcomplicating things at, at that age. And is there any concern that perhaps you had an influx of viewers from Tipperary or Wexford and you're after training the next generation of rivals by, by accident? Yeah, look, there, there's, great, there's great banter that way, yeah. You know, there's Wexford, Waterford, Tip logging on. Um, you know, got, got a great response from um, up, up the north. Um, massive. Um, I, think, I think the north, um, obviously, I can see my insights of, of who was logging on, and it was the north who were, who, who were the most, uh, most logging on because those guys, you know, we played, we went to Newry to play um, Slough Neil up there. And the crowd atmosphere up there um, that day was 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 unbelievable because mm. you know, these guys are up there on their own. You don't get to see much of us um, uh, around. Um, so, and then obviously for me doing the PE, I see I, I had every person up 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 north Northern Ireland um, log it on. Yeah. What was your routine when you were that age, TJ? When you were a child trying to guess to a, a, an extremely competent level uh, as a young hurler? Was it a wall at home? Was it an alley you, you went to? Or how, how did you pick up those skills? Yeah, um, I live out in rural Valley Hill. <laughs> um, um, I have three brothers, two older, one younger. And yeah, very much so. It was from day one that you could walk, you're given a hurley and a ball. And after that, it's just developing your skills. You know, we used to go... Um, we used to go and change cattle, um, move move cows from next field, and walking cows up and down the road. And we'd have a hurls and balls with us every time. And you know, you'd be striking over and back over the cows. And so it was very much having the hurl in your hand every day of the week. I remember going to to um, to my first day in primary school, and I brought me a hurl and him to with me. You know, I was only going to. Um, uh, junior infants and the prince the principal told me to no TJ you're not allowed to bring your hurling helmet so I, I started crying the first day because I wanted to I wanted to play um, play with the bigger boys but I wasn't allowed um, and then obviously you see the pictures in St. Kieran's College of the young young lads bringing their hurls to school so that was very much the same as me um, you know I was in school with Richie Hogan um, Lester Ryan um, Richie Power and it was exact same as it is now we just we used to bring our hurls and balls with, her, with, with us every day of the week and then you know as I said it's about repetition so we, we just unknown to ourselves we're, we're developing developing and practicing and practicing and then unknown to ourselves then obviously we got the opportunity then to wear the black and amber jersey but it all starts from a young age you know I played hurling football soccer wasn't very good at most of those, so um, I had to make the the, the call to go hurling. Um, to go hurling. So at that age, you're playing every sport. Um, yeah, you know, player burnout at that age doesn't come into it. You're going playing rounders. You're playing tennis, basketball. You know, you're playing as much sport as, as you can. And then obviously, look, you 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 become natural to 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 one sport. All those sport and sport and activities helps you develop. As a player, not a player, but an athlete, you know, you're getting fitter, you're getting stronger, you're more agile, you know. So all those uh, different different sports um, do help um, players as well. 
it seems that trying to play with the older fellas was something that was always part of your upbringing in a hurling sense because you were uh, the sub goalkeeper in the Fela team at the age of 10, I think. That's right, yeah. Uh, How did that, that uh, was, was there any hope for you as a, as a goalkeeper beyond that? Or did they, when did they realise that you were too good to, to be put between the posts? Um, yeah, I was 10. You know, I was, yeah, I, I won a Fela and Grail um, All Ireland final down in Scarty. We bet Tumi Vara in the final and uh, you know it was a, a great memory I remember um, it was a Friday we had the parade through in Escorti you know there was thousands of people out, outside there was probably I don't know how many teams were representing the Fela but you'd, you'd, every club in the county were over there present down in Escorti and I remember as a young, young, young kid at 10 years of age the club gave us um, a gear bag and shorts and socks. And, you know, at that age, receiving that was, was, was like Christmas. And then mm. parading through Enniscarp, the, um, the Artine band and the crowds out, you know, it was, it was a special memory. And, um, but yeah, I was a goalie, sub-goalie. Um, but I was, my first year playing for Ballyhale Shamrocks, I was on goal as well. So I was, um, I was 16. Um, yeah, I was 16 playing for... Um, Lining up for Bally Hill, um, I was on goal uh, that year. Um, so sorry, I was on the on the fourteen development squads for county. I was um, I was sub goalie as well. So I had um, had a good history of of playing as a as a, a sub keeper. Um, so I had so and lucky enough, I developed. I got a little bit bigger, um, a little bit faster. Um, I lost my puppy fat and. Uh, and <laughs> And I developed, um, I developed into a, a forward end, so I did. Would you have held Owen Murphy off for the number one jersey? Uh, I don't know. Looking at him the last couple of years, um, <laughs> it would take a quite, um, it would take a good goalie to, to knock Owen Murphy off. It's interesting that you mentioned burnout there. Uh, like, this seems to be the first real break you've got as a hurler since the age of 16. But at the same time, you're not one of those hurdlers who ever seems to get injured. Like at the same time, are you thankful for the break or because of your good injury record, are you thinking to yourself, Jesus, this was very frustrating the way things happened this year? Um, yeah, look, um, for, for me, um, you know, it's, I'm not getting younger. Um, it, it, for me, it's a kind of a, a waste of a year. Um, you know, unfortunately, just the, it is the way it is, and then you, you, we have to accept the guidelines and accept the call from the government. But yeah, look, um, when you're playing, when you're involved, and when you're in business, and when you're playing sports, to lose um, six months of the year is uh, it's, it's 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 a waste of a year. Um, but yeah, look, it it gave me the opportunity to to, um, to take a break um, mentally more so than physically, but like physically. I was training four, four, four nights in the week during the lockdown anyway. So um, in terms of physical shape-wise and fitness levels, um, I'm in um, the best shape ever. Uh, most players around the county had opportunities, had opportunity to look after themselves in terms of the fitness. You know, there was no alcohol on board because popular clothes, there was no restaurants or takeaways open. So players had the opportunity to, to, to mind themselves a little bit better and obviously like most people most people took up walking cycling and running and people were probably walking twice three times a day cycling mm -hmm. three times a day because of just boredom so and that's the same as us you know i'm sure players around the county were probably doing more now because they have more free time um, on, on their side but for me it was the, the mental side of it you know i hadn't a break ever um, i was you know, every Sunday, either training or a match, you know, on Monday morning, you know, you're getting your head psyched for the next game, um, mental preparation, you know, you're trying to avoid going downtown because you'd be talking to people about the match mm. or whatnot, or even talk about your own performance, you played bad or you played good, and psychologically then you're just, your head is, is on overdrive. So for me... Yeah, I enjoyed the break in terms of the, the mental side of it, just being fresh, just waking up on a Sunday morning, um, doing things that I, I couldn't do. Or even the Saturday um, before a game, you know, you're, like your head is 
you focus on the game, you're not relaxed, you're thinking, you're focusing, your mind is 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 thinking about the opposition. So yeah. for me that the the mental side of it was nice to take a break, just to slow down, relax, enjoy what you have in front of you. But I was very lucky that I look I had a rural farm, I was on my farm every day. Um I have my own pedigree limousines at home. So I was very lucky that I could escape to that. Not not a lot of people who are in towns and in apartments. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I hadn't that, and I again, I, I'm sure that was very tough. So when you're out in the rural areas, it's good to have the fresh air, and you know, I live in a farm, so I have plenty of fields to go puck and go running. So it's very much a um, fortunate for that. When you say it's a good mental break, do you often think about your game then? When you're in season, like if there wasn't a break this year, would you have been thinking a lot? about how last year finished up, for example? Would it be something that goes through your mind quite a lot? Well, yeah, look, if for me, um, yeah, look, you get to look back on videos and certain matches because um, obviously you yeah, had the time to, to look back on games and and look back on, on last year. Um, and, yeah, it, it did. It, it gave, I'm, sort of, I'm sure the other players had opportunities and look, we were doing Zoom calls as well. So uh, with, with with Brian Cody and and we were and uh, I'm analysing games last year and whatnot. So look, yeah, it did give give you t- time to to look back on on last year and 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 try trying to I suppose um, look at the positives as well. And look, last year's last year. Um, yes, you look back, you learn from mistakes, you adapt to it, and. You find areas where where you can improve as a team, and this year again, look, it's a totally different year, um, totally different hurling. If if championship does go ahead in November, December, it's going to be totally different than last year again because weather conditions, um, crowd is going to be different. Um, so ball is going to be greasier, ball is going to be heavier, ground conditions is going to be slightly slightly heavier. So. Yeah. Again, yeah, last year is going to endorse the Tipperary Ireland champions, um, deservedly so. Um, but this year is very much so. Just I think every player, um, just looking forward to getting back. I think and 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 yeah, in life when when you're when you're rushing, 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 you kind of take things for granted. Um, so I think when every player does get the opportunity to get back into uh, their county jerseys, they they'll, they'll cherish that jersey even more. For sure. Uh, on a professional level, then, how is the gym trade going? Because that is one of the areas that's one of the sectors that has been very, very difficult to reopen properly. Yeah, um, back opened um, with protocols and booking systems and um, and and guidelines to to um, to to monitor and look after. Um, yeah, look, it, it, look, we 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 have no point lying about it. We've had casualties in terms of um, membership loss. Um, and a good law on that because, you know, people have lost jobs. People are still have that uncertainty about the COVID. People have young families at home, grandparents at home. So the unfortunate thing, you're going to cancel your, your membership. Um, and yeah, look, our job is to try to reinsure them and give them confidence that, look, this, we, we have X, Y, and Z going on here. It's a safe environment. Um, but unfortunately, if we we can if we can keep them here. Um, so it is tough. Um, we know at the end of this month what what casualties we have, and then we just um, make a plan then for the next couple of months. Um, but I'm very lucky um, that I have a a thirteen thousand square feet premises. Yeah. Um, I invested in the marquee. Very much lucky enough that I have. So all the classes I provide are outside in the marquee, and then people who are coming to the gym are inside in the gym facility. So in the gym facility, so two the two um, the classes and the gym is separated. So the cl- people come to the classes are not meeting people in the gym. So so look, we went we we went um, not overboard, but we're doing as much as we could to to give people that confidence that look, we, this is this is the safe place to be. And and look, it has been tough um, because we don't. I spent three years building the business, and then mm. obviously our members. If if I have zero members, um, unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a business. So membership growth is 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 the is the key. 
and and yeah, look, we we have lost people, but we've gained people on the back of other leisure centres um, not able to provide um, the service we're able to provide because we have the space. The space yeah. All the equipment are two metres apart. The marquee is outside um, and we can fit um, 40 people socially distanced three metres apart out there. So so we're very fortunate that, that I, we have the, the capacity, capacity to, to, to look after people. Yeah, it seems that the, the, the space is a key thing at the moment in the entire industry. Uh, j just one last thing, TJ, before we let you go. Uh, we've been doing a, a series on the show over the last little while about the, the Mount Rushmore of every county and the, the top four sports people from their county. Needless to say, Kilkenny was ravaged with controversy with the decision that uh, DJ Carey made it in ahead of Henry Sheffin. Uh, I, I won't ask you to, to talk about yourself or anybody else here, but in that particular battle, if you had to reverse that and the power was in your hands, would you have taken the opportunity to put Sheffin up there ahead of DJ? I thought I'd be number one, no? <laughs> <laughs> Needless to say, not even a debate. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, look, I don't know. I can't, I can't comment because <laughs> DJ is, is my selector at the moment and <laughs> Henry is living um, a puck of a ball away from me. So... I, I can't make the decision on, on that, but if I was picking, I'll put DJ Carey full for and Henry Sheff at number 11 and, <laughs> and myself on the wing, and we'll have a good team. Uh, not, not a bad forward line there. How no. different were they uh, as players in terms of the attributes they brought to the game, in your view? Yeah, look, DJ was the goal getter, wasn't mm. he? Um, I think when DJ got the ball, there was, he had that, that sudden pace, ex ex acceleration, and the whole crowd. Um, um, when he got the ball, you know, just the atmosphere rose. Um, Henry was was very much um, the hardest working player on the team. Um, you know, very much different roles, centre forward, full forward. Mm. And when you're full forward, your job is to, is to get the ball into me and I'll do the rest. But Henry was the grafter. He, he, he led the whole um, structure of the team, organising positions out there. Because when you're centre forward, you know, you, you get to see the role a little bit different out there, and he's very much, um, you know, the hardest work. I think a few games he mightn't even have scored, but he came out man in the match because of his work rate, blocking, hooking, um, and then creating other scores for for his teammates. So I think that DJ and Henry had two different roles, but um, I wouldn't say no to any of them. The thing that's been a theme throughout all the 32 counties has been those that are still playing, unfortunately, uh, are at a disadvantage. Uh, do you read into that? Do you, do you care about the fact that your legacy has often been spoken about at this point and you are compared with the greatest to have ever played the game? Like, I mean, is it something that you can read into at all? Um, you, 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 you can't and you can. Obviously, yeah, look, it, it's, it's, nice to, it's nice to be recognised up there, but um, I'm not finished yet. Mm. Uh, um, yeah, it, look, it, it, it does inspire you on um, to be better. Um, it does inspire you on, okay, look, I'm at this stage. How can I get to the next level? Or how can I overcome all these people? So, yeah, look, it, do, it, it very much does inspire you. Um, not going to lie, it gives you that motivation, that drive, um, and it gives you a kind of a, that extra push. Um, but, look, yeah, you, you can't read into it. Um, you're only as good as your last game, um, so yeah. But yeah, look, it's it's nice to be it's it's nice to be recognised. But but I think yes, when you retire, you you, you get to cherish those those um those awards even more. And, and I think it's, it's when you get to you know I'm 32 now, and when you when you get to the 30s, the later stage, you appreciate the game more. You appreciate you appreciate. You can send pictures, you know, when you're 21, you wouldn't imagine having a picture um, up on the wall or up, 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 up in your mantelpiece. But now when you get to 30, 31, 32, you get to tre cherish those moments mm. and people, a lot of photographers from Sports File sending send the best pictures um, around in terms of what games you've been playing on. And when you're only 21, 22, you wouldn't dream of, of putting up a picture um, of a game at home but now you, you get to think a little bit different about it and you get to cherish those pictures and, and it's nice to, 
look back at those pictures and and those memories that that you built over um, over the the years as well. And obviously, when you retire, then you can appreciate um, those um, those pictures even more. You know, I have people come to the house, and you um, you get to see the pictures as well, and you get to talk talk to them about those certain pictures. But I have one lovely one, which was um in Crow Park. It was um, usually they have a picture of the the club all Ireland winning team inside in Crow Park when you walk in when you walk in um into the into the Hogan stand they have the the football club all Ireland the hurling and it's a big massive picture. But lucky enough um I was up with some award and they asked me to obviously the club all Ireland was being played the year after so they were taking away that big picture of the team and I was captain that year as well in two thousand fifteen so I have a big massive um picture of the whole team and a picture of me lifting the cup and I have that open in the kitchen at home and you know it's a very ter- very cherishing to, to to have those pictures. Yeah, that's class. Uh, you have been listening to TJ Reid, who was today launching AIB's The Toughest Summer, a documentary which will tell the story of the summer of 2020, which saw an unprecedented halt put to GAA. This series is made up of five webisodes as well as a full-length feature documentary to air on RTE One on August 25th. TJ features in the first webisode that will be available on AIB's YouTube channel this Thursday. TJ Reid, fair play on everything you've done over the last few months. The, the children of Ireland, thank you, I'm sure, and the parents of Ireland, indeed. Uh, thanks, William, for joining us. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Thursday Night Football with John Giles. Johnny Giles is a national treasure. When he speaks, uh, I mean, I'm like, yes, yes, yes. When he's on the show, I was in the car the other day, I parked the car and I sprinted into the house and turned on the radio. I love listening to him. I love Johnny Giles. John Giles, every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. on OTB Sports Radio, live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. Missing this? I remember Ollie text me so scared. One or two people would get hold of my number, unfortunately, and he would text me. <laughs> then get this, the all-new OTB Sports app. Off the Ball, Ireland's premier sports channel, now has a new home, featuring the biggest names in Irish and world sports. Podcasts, interviews, news, commentary, analysis, plus almost 20 years of sporting archives. All free and ready when you are, at home or on the go. The new OTB Sports app. Download it now from the App Store and Google Play. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. You can say it's grand. It's not grand if you're not on it, though. OTB AM's Mount Rushmore. OK, it is time to turn our attention to south of the River Liffey. The north Dublin Mount Rushmore has been done. We've got Liam Brady, John Giles, Stephen Cluxon and Brian O'Driscoll there. Now we've got the south Dublin Mount Rushmore next up. We've got Phil Egan and Stephen Doyle here. Lads, how are you getting on? Great stuff, Owen. All good? Yeah, all good, yeah. Uh, let's start with this controversial idea that we have indeed split Dublin in two, Steve. How do you feel about that? I'm absolutely disgusted, Owen. Um, <laughs> Well, look, you know, people start saying, well, this is just the same as in GAA where they're trying to split Dublin too because we're so successful. I actually, to be honest with you, I, what I think we really should do is because Dublin is, of course, the most important uh, county in Ireland, we really should have six heads on our Mount Rushmore. I, I don't know if Phil agrees with that. I think it's eight. Good point, Why not eight? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, there was talk this morning of splitting it into four and uh, things are getting quite messy already. I, I didn't realise... The, the thing as well, sorry, Owen, to cut across you, but the thing is as well, un, unlike Kerry, we're not limited just to just one sport, you know? We're, we're multifaceted. We can play snooker. We can do athletics. We can do GAA. <laughs> you know, we can do boxing. We can, like, you name your sport, we could do it, Owen. I'm not sure about down the kingdom, but we, we're pretty talented all round. You obviously missed our Kerry Mount Rushmore where there was an illustrious array of different sports. But of course, only four (laughs) footballers made it on the mountain uh, in the end. Uh, Phil, what are the the first things that come to your mind when you think about the great sports people of South Dublin? Is there any names that immediately come to the tip of your tongue? Yeah, well, growing up in South Dublin, obviously watching the Irish football team, 
Paul McGrath was the name that was mentioned because of the, the Docky United connection. And I'm going to show you something here, obviously, which off the ball viewers and the OTB AM viewers as well will be very familiar with this World Cup 90 folder. And people wonder where it came from. Well, it's mine. All right. I kindly, <laughs> I kindly donated it. So if I, you know, if I go, it's coming with me. No, I, I, but, but at the front of this is there's a couple of autographs. It's quite fitting as well, like uh, given the week that's in it, uh, Jack Charlton laid to rest. But there's two autographs in there. The top one is Paul McGrath, and the other one is Jack Charlton. But the Paul McGrath right. one, so I, I, a young Philly and growing up in South Dublin, there was a, a letter for me it, it, that came through the letterbox, and you know, which would never have happened as a, as a young kid. Or why would it? Like, I mean, all I had at that stage was a few football jerseys and my Henry the Hippo Ulster Bank uh, money saver <laughs> thing you know, with a few coins in it. But this arrived in anyway, and my dad said, oh, look, there's a letter here for you. I opened it up, there it is. And it, it read, uh, to Philip Egan, this is my full name, best wishes, Paul McGrath. And what that did for me as a kid, my God, it was, that was, I treasured it. And obviously I still have it, but, it, you know, it's around the time when Ireland are playing in these major tournaments. Paul McGrath is one of the key figures in it. You know, the more you, you think back to what's been revealed, what was going through or what he was going through at the time, um, you know, between like things off the pitch, obviously injuries as well. I mean, we know how, how bad his knee was and there he is playing in a couple of World Cups, Mark and Roberto Baggio out of a game, getting named in the you know, getting named PFA Player of the Year and the Team of the Year as well. Just unbelievable. And, you know, how he got to all that, it's just an incredible story. And I think when you talk about Mount Rushmore, it's fine characters like Paul McGrath. An absolute legend is kind of what is a prerequisite for a Mount Rushmore with the amount of quality that Dublin has. Being an extremely high achiever is not going to be enough, Stephen. It is going to be somebody that needs to be in the hearts of the entire nation, really. Yeah, definitely. I, I've been watching all these Mount Rushmore's county by county very closely. And I know a lot of the response that we get in social media is people kind of listing out the achievements of all these different sports people. And, and rightly so, because, you know, we've had some great um, sports people both on the world stage and, and back here. But um, for me, Mount Rushmore is somebody who's iconic, um, somebody who represents the Irish spirit. And I think Paul McGrath did that brilliantly. Like if he, I suppose if you just look at his achievements at, at first, you know, he, he went to play for St. Patrick's Athletic before Manchester United. He only played about 30 matches. He won the PFAI Player of the Year um, in his first season there before moving on to Manchester United. Of course, we know he had a you know, decent uh, success at United. He won an FA Cup there. He got to two finals. Um, he was competing with United. He got, I think they came second to Liverpool in 88 um, under Ferguson before Ferguson moved him on then to Aston Villa and we know he's an absolute hero at Aston Villa the, the famous thing they still sell Aston Villa shirts with Paul's number five and, and God on them at Villa Park um, you know as Phil said the amount of injuries that he had as well um, we know towards the, the, the latter end of his career he, he had no knees um, I was kind of looking back when he moved on to Derby County um, interestingly enough I think it was 1997 they played a game, Derby County, against Manchester United at Old Trafford. United were going for the league title. They only had a six-point lead, I think, at the time. Derby County went to Old Trafford and they beat Manchester United with three goals to two. Paul McGrath got man of the match in 1997. He was nearly 37 years of age. Like That's incredible. Mm. And that, that, to me, epitomises what Paul McGrath was all about. When the, when the odds were stacked against him, you know, he just he pulled it out of the bag every single time. Um, and if you look at his caps as well, it was 83 caps. Like, that was a player of his generation. That's a phenomenal amount of caps, you know. I know we're, we're used to seeing Irish internationals now getting 100 caps or more, not so much on a regular basis, but there's there's a handful of them now. And that's because there are so many international games. But to, for Paul to get 83 caps um, for a man who struggled with fitness issues so badly. But to me as well, you know, during that period of success for Ireland when Paul McGraw was the leader of that team playing in a couple of different positions as well, wherever Jack Charlton wanted, wanted to play, he did his job. But he was the only Irish player in that team who had a chance for him and him only. You know, and I remember being on the South Terrace 
with my uh, two two pound schoolboy ticket, uh, going to Ireland games. And you know when Paul was playing at his at his best and the crowd all chanting "Ooh, ah, Paul McGrath," it was it's there was an ex- there was an experience there was not an experience nothing like it really going to Irish matches at the time. And I think if there was an Irish man much more, I think Paul McGrath would be honest. So um, I don't think there's any question. Of Paul McGrath being left off a Dublin Mount Rushmore, whether it be south side, north side, the whole county. He's, he's just an absolute legend. I think it's fair to say that he's the first name up on the mountain from the south side. Both of you totally agree on this. Is there anybody from the sport of football that would come close to knocking Paul McGrath off the mountain? I Well, look, you could list off a few names there. Robbie Keane, our record goal scorer. Um, 68 goals. He's number 17 in the world. He's the 15th in the he's 15th in the all-time Premier League goal scoring list. Got 127 Premier League goals, I think. Um, you know, proud Talaman. Uh, he was, you know, an iconic Premier League player for so many years at Tottenham Hotspur. Um, went off and to play for LA Galaxy, and you know, we did great things with LA Galaxy and helped, I suppose, inject soccer into the consciousness of uh, of of America um, for many years. Um, a captain of the team for so long, and um, and of course, you know, a scorer of an iconic goal at, at the 2002 World Cup against Germany. I think Richard Dunn could be mentioned as well. A uh, fantastic player, great servant over the years, um, did great things in the Premier League. And then, of course, Damien Duff, um, back to back league winner with um, with Chelsea, um, took a Fulham team, helped take a Fulham team to a, a European final as well, a very unfancied Fulham team. And uh, you know he's doing great things in coaching as well. Now he's given back uh, to to his country, and he's he's helped Celtic achieve the nine rows as, as a coach as well. There's, I suppose, there are just three I can kind of mention off the top of my head. And I'm sure Phil mm. would uh, would mention more as well. Yeah, yeah. Like Robbie Keane, I think is like the three you mentioned. Robbie Keane would be the the one I would pick out of those three because I think one thing that has transpired since Robbie Keane has left international football. And this was the talk around the time he was coming to the end that maybe he'd be appreciated more when he left because we'd realise how good he was. Because when he broke into the team, he was you know, was a teenager, chirpy, you know, full of confidence. Sometimes Irish people don't like too much confidence and swagger because they think, you know, you know, he's this young lad going around thinking he can take on the world. But you think back to the the, the playoff against Iran, he comes up with a goal in that game, then the Germany goal, which Steve mentioned as well, but even the Spain game, like you know, he had the bottle to to knock that penalty and to send it into extra time. Ian Hart had missed a penalty. Robbie Keane steps up, scores his penalty, and then takes a penalty in the shootout as well. It wasn't a very good shootout for Ireland, but Robbie Keane came up with the goods. And he's there was for some reason there was this there was talk that he you know he didn't score goals in big games, which I just I mean we've just mentioned a few there that. When, when the pressure was on, Robbie Keane came up with the goals. And even if you're talking about his Premier League career, you both be very familiar with the, the Premier League 100 club. If you watch his array of goals in that as well, I mean, he scores all sorts of goals. Which, like, I remember he scored one from outside the box for Spurs against Chelsea, Carl's in the top corner. One that he scores where it results from a throw-in, where it comes from a throw-in where he chips the ball over a few players against Blackburn. He just scored brilliant goals. And... Um, Obviously, since he's gone, we don't score as many goals, and hopefully that will change under, under Stephen Kenny. But, but Richard Dunn is one of those as well, where you know he, he goes down as one of the, the, the great Ireland defenders. But unfortunately, you know you can't put him in the same category as as Paul McGrath or um, even uh, the likes of Liam Brady, Johnny Giles. Yeah, and we might get into the idea of. Uh, who actually wins out in the countywide football chat if we have time at the end. But I do want to move on, Stephen. I'm not sure where you want to go next. We have Paul McGrath up as a definite so far. He's definitely on the mountain. We've run the rule over uh, a couple of the, the footballers who might join him. But who would be your second pick? Because you're going to go elsewhere for, from football now at this point. Well, I'll, I'll move into an area um, where Phil is probably more of an expert than, than I am. But um, I'm also a, a big boxing fan. And there's there's two names I can mention straight off the top here, and it's uh, Bernard Dunn and Michael Crute. Um I remember going to the Bernard Dunn World Title fight against Ricardo Cordoba, and um, when he won that World Title, and 
you know, it was just, you know, we'd seen Bernard Dunn going through so many tough nights as a boxer against Kiko Martinez and the point. And he was, um, you know, I suppose one of those guys where he wasn't a hugely, one of the most talented boxers you've ever seen, but my God, that fella really had great determination, heart and spirit and something that I think Irish people like to see in their sports, people that represent them on the world stage. And that Cordoba fight is one of the most amazing sporting events I've ever been at in any sport. Um, I can't think of any really that can, that can match it. Um, he, he was on his arse twice in that fight and got back up on his feet, knocked down Cordoba three times himself. And the atmosphere in the Point Theatre that night was just absolutely phenomenal. Like he was just, and you know, there was, you could say that there was a, a case to be made for the crowd carrying Bernard Dunn through that fight. But I also think that it was almost a case of Bernard Dunn kind of leading the support. And uh, it was kind of like he was like the kind of, the man leading the, this crazy Irish band of supporters into battle against Cordoba. And it was just, a, it was a phenomenal achievement. You know, we don't have a huge amount of uh, world titles um, regards regards to boxers in Dublin. Um, but Bernard Dunn is one of them. I think that's why he's definitely in the discussion. Um, I'm, I'm pretty disgusted that Steve Collins hasn't really been mentioned with regard to the north side of things. But maybe Phil might mention him. But I'd like to talk about Michael Crute as well because... I think Michael Crute would be in my final four. And I'll tell you why. Um, Ireland hadn't won an Olympic gold medal since 1956, going into the Barcelona Olympics in 1992. Ronnie Delaney, of course, won in Melbourne on the athletics track. So we've gone a long, long time without a gold medal. Um, we'd never won a gold medal in boxing. Michael Crute. You know, he came from you know very humble background, walking sound, not too far from my group myself in Kilimana. Um, my dad actually worked with his Michael Crute's wife's husband, uh, dad as well, so kind of knew the family a little bit. Um, so he was a real kind of a, a local hero, I suppose, in a way. But again, Crute was one of these people that went and represented Ireland on the world stage and just did, had a phenomenal achievement. He went into that final um, against the Cuban guy Sierra. Now, Cuba had nine boxers in 12 finals at that 1992 Olympics. They were basically like the Brazil of boxing um, for many years going to Olympic Games, and especially at that one in 1992. Nine boxers at the 12 finals. Only two Cubans lost out of those nine finals, and one of them lost to Michael Crute. Um, I remember getting up. It was a Saturday morning. I remember getting up and watching the fight with my dad, and it's just... it's. Uh, just one of those lovely childhood memories. And um, when Crute won, I just, I can still remember him celebrating. Um, and I can remember him coming home to Dublin. I remember going out onto the streets to, to meet him and, and the, the reception he got was just incredible. And he's just one of those Irish people like Katie Taylor, like Potter Carrington, um, you know, people that have, achieved, have, achieved, have achieved success in the world stage and lifted, lifted the country, like the Irish soccer team did as well. Um, and I think his achievement gets forgotten a little bit too easily. And we shouldn't forget it because what he did was absolutely phenomenal. As I said, Cuba, they were, they were like Brazil in football to boxing. And, and for Michael Crew to go and beat one of those guys in a final to do what he did was just, was just incredible. And not to forget as well, he went on, worked in the backroom team with the Dublin Hurlers as well. I know it was as a masseuse, but apparently his, some of his team talks were quite inspirational. He was part of the... Dublin hurling backroom team that uh, the Dublin team that won that first Lancer title in 60 years. Um, by all accounts, Anthony Daly said he gave a very inspirational uh, dressing room talk the following year when Dublin, the verge of relegation, helped him to uh, go out and win and uh, to avoid relegation. So look, he's he's a he's a great man, Michael Crute. I think his Olympic gold medal is one of the greatest achievements in Irish sport. I, I, that's why I would argue to have him up there. It's a strong case. Michael Carruth, the second name on your list, Steve-O. Phil, over to you, the, the boxing hierarchy. Where yeah. does it lie in your view? Oh, well, I'm just glad, because like, one thing I think I, I have felt over the last few weeks with uh, different Mount Rushmore's is boxing getting overlooked. But um, Fair point. Yeah. No, I, look, it's, not a, it, it's so hard to, to whittle things down to four, but the admiration I have for boxers, that what they go through to 
to get themselves ready for these fights. And, and sometimes they go into these big fights and they're they're not in the best shape of their life because something might have happened along the way. There's little bumps and, you know, what we see on the day, we expect them to be able to perform to the best of, the, of their ability. It doesn't always happen. But as Steve-O alluded to, that, that final in, in Barcelona, Michael Crude's going up against um, Juan Hernandez Sierra, who is the current world champion at the time. He's the Pan-American champion. This is a guy that won more world titles as well. The fact that Michael Carruth beat him. So not only is he winning an Olympic gold medal, but he's beaten the best to do it. And, you know, they say you have to you, you have to win, you have to beat the best. But sometimes the draw, you know, you could be on the other side of the draw, but he's actually taken out a guy who is the best in the final. You know, it, it, it's a day that I'll never forget. I, I too, obviously, watch it. We obviously have... Um, my mom is from Donegal, so we used to spend summers in Donegal, and I remember getting up to watch it, and we were sitting in the house, and obviously Wayne McCullough had fought that day as well. He, he got the silver medal. But you, just the way it, it's set up, where you, you know, obviously, the score is kind of going in, but it's all hidden until that last decision. Referee's holding the two arms, and you don't know whose arm is going to raise. And when Michael Carruth's, like, actually, when... When Steve, I was talking about Michael Carruth there, like I was kind of getting goosebumps because you just think back to the moment and it's just an amazing, amazing moment for, for Irish sport. And even touching, I was lucky enough actually to cover, I was working for Dublin Station at the time. I, as Steve, I would have covered the footballers that year in 2013. I was covering the hurlers. And obviously Michael Carruth was part of that, but the players absolutely adored him. Um, you know, obviously he's, there to do a job but the advice he'd give them and just that spirit that himself and Anthony Daly and the rest of the management team would have would have given and you could see it because we'd be waiting around the bus that was the year that Dublin went to a replay against Kilkenny and they beat them in Port Leash after people saying you don't give Kilkenny a second chance but you're waiting around the bus and you see all these guys going out and Mike Carruth was just one of these lads that all the all the lads absolutely loved Bernard Dunn, I was there that night. Steve, I know you were working. I was there as a, as a patron. And I have to say, it's up there with the best sporting events I've ever been to. Obviously, it's the same day Ireland win the Grand Slam. And I remember I'm, I'm ironing my shirt to go to the point that night <laughs> as Ronan O'Gara kicks the winning drop goal. And I just can't wait for this Bernard Dunn fight yeah, because, yeah. you know, it was there for the disappointment of when Kiko Martinez beat him in the first round. Yeah. And it was disappointing not only to lose for Bernard Dunn, but yeah, the fact that, that, that it emptied the, the venue out very quickly. And I kind of thought Bernard yeah, Dunn deserved better. Fun. So yeah. the fact that he redeemed it on the night yeah. against Cordoba, he got up off the deck and it was just an explosive electric atmosphere. And even when he went on to lose his world title fight against Poon Spot, there was the admiration there that he was applauded out of the arena. He got that, you know, that admiration was there that connection between Bernard Dunn and the Dublin people and, and Irish sports fans as well was there and yeah as Steve said you don't win many world titles and <clears throat> to, to do it and the manner that he did it as well was was incredible and yeah I was surprised Steve Collins maybe didn't get enough love because one thing we talk about a lot in boxing is that that era of Ben and, and Eubank Collins beat them both yeah mm. Yeah, the we, be, beat you back twice. It's, it's, it's a good point. Uh, like, we do have Brian Kerr on the overall Dublin list, by the way, who's a big uh, boxing aficionado. So he might be able to get uh, Steve Collins a better mention, despite the fact that North Dublin's already been and gone. So we, we're not limiting it to what makes it to the north side or the south side mountain. But just to confirm, so Phil, you would definitely have Mikey Cruz as your number one boxer from South Dublin. Yeah, I would. And it's it's a tough one because I don't want to diminish what Bernard Dunn did, which was incredible. But I just, I think that Olympic glory, Michael Cruz, yeah, I, I would definitely have him. I can't, I can't argue with that selection. Okay. Yeah, it's funny as well, actually, because Bernard Dunn, as we, <clears throat> just, just to add, it's funny as well, I suppose, coincidental that Bernard Dunn, of course, went on to, um, <clears throat> help out with the Dublin senior football team they went to have all that success so just unusual that you had two boxers you know that achieved great things and then going on to use their I suppose motivational talents to, uh, to help both codes in, uh, in Dublin GAA Well will we go to your GAA pick then Stephen? Yeah look um, well I suppose just to, to add on to what we were talking about from the, the, the soccer end of things and there's a man there that straddles 
both the uh, soccer GA worlds, um, who doesn't make my list, but uh, I, I, t- I thought long and hard about it, but Kevin Moran, um, what a man, like just an incredible, incredible all round talented sportsman. Um, you know, he's he goes to win, he wins two All Ireland's with Dublin, and um, before going on then to, to have a, a really good career with Manchester United, um, wins an FA Cup with him. I know he was sent off in the game, but uh, still achieved great things with that Manchester United team. They went off and played La Liga football with Sporting Hion. And then, you know, he's in his late 30s and he goes on and has, makes nearly 150 appearances for Blackburn Rovers when he, you know, it was so hard for players back then, you know, who were kind of in their early to mid-30s uh, to keep going. Um, they obviously didn't have the access to kind of the sports science that players do nowadays to help extend their careers. But, you know, Kevin Moore, and, and, you know, he was before my time, really, when it comes to Gaelic football. Um, and, like, I would have been going to Crow Park with my dad from the early 80s. But um, he would have told me quite a lot about Kevin Moore. And he, I suppose even you watch the old footage, like, he, he kind of, to me, he kind of epitomised that kind of really battling, driving hard as nails player, like, that really kind of motivates his teammates, not by his words, but by the way he plays. And he was the same for Manchester United as well. And I had a great partnership there with Paul McGrath for a short time at Old Trafford. Um, and, you know, he, he just always comes across a great guy. And one of those fellas as well, that's, he's loved by his his fellow county people um, all over Dublin. You know, you mentioned Kevin Moore's name and, and, and people love him. Um, there's a couple of other honourable mentions. And when I tweet out that we're going to be talking about this today, there's a few people mentioned Jim Stein's name. And uh, I know he's not strictly a, a Gaelic man, but he grew up a Gaelic man and obviously moved off to Australia then and became an absolute legend of Australian football, um, Aussie rules. Um, you know, uh, and sadly we lost him obviously a number of years ago, a number of years ago to cancer. But um, you speak to anybody in in Dublin GAA circles and about Jim Steins, and you know he's he's a very highly respected man. I've spoken to a couple of his teammates. Paul Clark would have played with him minor level and knew him very well, very close to him, and uh, he speaks uh, really highly of Jim Steins. You know he he went over to play Aussie Rules, um, obviously not. An Aussie real player, but he made he had a record 244 consecutive appearances for Melbourne. Um, he won the Brownlow Medal, who's the he's the only non-Australian-born player to win the Brownlow Medal, medal, which is the highest honor in the game for the best and fairest player. He won the MVP in that same year as well. Um, but then he went on <clears throat> after he retired from AFL. He went on to do some great charity work, um, youth charity work, uh, which you know he's highly respected for in Australia. There's a room in the Melbourne cricket grounds named after Jim Steins. Like, that's not even a sport. And they have a room at the, one of the most famous cricket grounds in the world named after him. So that kind of goes to show you um, how highly respected Jim Steins um, was and is still to this day. Of course, uh, Ballybone uh, club man as well, I should mention. Um, there's another man from his club, Ballybone, saying then is Michael Darren McCauley. I think deserves an honourable mention. Seven All Ireland's, uh, one All Ireland with his club, Bally Bowden, as well. I think uh, you know he's a footballer of the year, obviously in 2013. I think he's been a great leader within that Dublin team. Very modest guy. Uh, I don't want to say too much about him because I know him personally, so I don't. I don't think I'm. Uh, I'm trying to uh, look for any favours here. But look, he's a great fellow, Michael. He's done some great work as well with uh, North Inner City Charities as well, which I think he's highly respected for, um, and I think he deserves a mention. Um, you know, Southside footballers. There's, there's, there's so many. I think the North Side on the edges. Paul Curran is another one. Yeah, actually, very, he's probably my favourite. He's probably my favourite player yeah. from that '95 team, where, you know, just Mister Consistent, always just marauding down the the right wing, uh, great defender, and obviously what he achieved. He, he obviously played Thomas Davis, but he would have played for my own club, Kilmacud as well. And you know, even what he did with Paddy Munn to get them to win the Dublin Championship with them and get them with, like to the final hurdle before they lost that club final, the All-Ireland club final. Um, you know, I was lucky enough to cover a good few of those games as well. So he was, uh, he was Mr. Consistence. But uh, yeah, the, the Jim Steins was, uh, was, was some player. Like, and even the documentary, when it shows you know, how he dealt with, with his illness, just an incredible human. Like, so, um, mm. And, you know, 
his brother Brian Stein was wasn't a bad wasn't a bad player either. Yeah, Paul Curran as well, of course, Phil, a uh, great manager as well. He won uh, he won Dublin County Championships with uh, Paddy won Kickhams. Uh, very unlucky not to win the final actually as well. Um, they only lost out by a point in 2013, I think it was, wasn't it? Paddy yeah. Monk Kickhams were in the final. So, um, uh, Paul Curran, you know, not just a great player, but also another great guy who's really, um, he's a GAA man at heart. And uh, he's a great guy for coaching young players and that kind of thing. Um, look, there's there's so many. And I, I think even growing up, when I when I was growing up, going to Cove Park, I think a lot of my heroes were probably Northsiders. Um, my mum and dad are both famous, so I kind of look at myself as a bit of a an honorary Northsider as well. But the likes of John O'Leary, he was a hero for me. Uh, Charlie Redmond, um, I think probably though as a young man, I was only probably 15, going to uh, Crow Park when we won the All Ireland in '95. J- Jason Sherlock was just you know an absolute hero and um, a brilliant player. I think an inspirational figure. He was, he was one of those players. I think that would have attracted a lot of young. Um, young men, young boys and girls uh, to play Gaelic football um, having seen his performances he made Gaelic football cool again in mm. the mid-90s I think he would have blown um, up social media he would have blown yeah. up social media with that goal <laughs> without his boot yeah absolutely and again since since we've kind of uh, you know since he's retired and we've learned a bit more about his background again another another really solid guy um, he went through a lot of tough stuff in his life um, and I think he also represents the new Dublin, the the new kind of um, Dublin, you know, we're very multi multi ethnic ethnic background of uh, uh, multi ethnic, I should say, Dublin, um, with his background and that kind of thing. So, another another great guy, Jason Sherlock. But look, I I think in the end, when you're plumping for a Southside representative for Gaelic football, sorry, I should mention as well, Owen, and, and I think it boiled down to two names for me. And one was a historical figure who I can't really tell you about as a player, but Kay Mills, I think, should be mentioned in the conversation because uh, Kay Mills was an absolute GAA superstar back in the early 1900s, from around 1930s up to the 1950s. Um, she won 15 All-Ireland titles with Dublin as a camogie player. Um, she was from Inch of Corps and an absolutely inspirational figure. There's a good piece about her on the Royal Irish Academy website. Um, no other player in the history of Gaelic Games has won 15 All-Ireland medals. Um, she sadly passed away kind of around the mid-90s, but um, there was a lovely line in the piece about her on the RIA website that said, um, after games, men used to take off their hats and look to shake her hands or shake her hand, which is a kind of, I suppose, when we see a women's sport is struggling nowadays uh, to, um, or not nowadays, it's, it's getting better, but over the last kind of few decades, we've seen how women's sport has struggled to to find equality with men's sport. Mm-hmm. And when you think back all those years and years and years and years ago, that a woman like that who was putting on these performances and people trying to uh, shake her hand after games, incredible. Fifteen all Ireland medals. There was talk of naming a bridge after in Dublin. I probably I think they probably sh- still should. Um, Sinead Goldrick is probably worth a mention as well. Three all Irelands in a row with Dublin. Um, she's off down playing Aussie rules now as well. A, a, a great player, one of the best probably the best defender of our generation, you could argue as well. But look, I think, I think I'm think i going to plumb for Jim Gavin in the end when it comes to a, a Gaelic representative. Um, Jim Gavin is just a phenomenal man. Um, and when I put the shout out on Twitter, his name just kept coming back to me. I think um, both for GA people, both casual fans and for true club people, um, he's a hero. Um, he won the All-Ireland as a player, obviously, in '95. Um, you wouldn't have been one of the big standout players, maybe not hugely talented, but um, a, a really important part of that Dublin team. He was, he had real grit and determination about his performances. And even when he, he, he kind of, um, when his his playing career was sort of fading out, by all accounts, everything you read, he was still there training sessions, working his nuts off and trying to help other players to be better men and better players as well. But look, his his achievements as a manager are just second to none. Um, I think Kevin Heffernan revolutionised the game back in the 60s and 70s. And Jim Gavin has has done the same uh, over the last you know 10 or so years. Uh, I suppose Gaelic football had a bit of a reputation for being quite defensive um, in, the, in the 2000s before Gavin came along. And of course, I know Sean Potts was paying great uh, tribute to Pat Kilroy. Um, as right, rightly he should, uh, Pat Kiroi was 
hugely instrumental in, in turning Gaelic football around in the city. Um, and Jim Gavin took over the reins and what he did was phenomenal. He's achieved the five in a row. Um, but he, he, he got that Dublin team playing a really uh, attractive brand of attacking football. You know, he made football exciting, I think, with the way he had that team playing. I know he had a, a big, or a, a bunch of hugely talented players to uh, at his disposal. But like so many great achievements. They went 35 league and championship matches unbeaten. That was absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Uh, to win six All-Ireland titles, the first manager to achieve five in a row. Um, like you could talk about Jim all day. Um, very selfless man. We know he's done a lot of training sessions around the country with different clubs. He's very giving with his time to, to clubs around the city as well. Um, and then you look at his achievements outside sport. You know, he's he's been honoured by the United Nations for his work in war zones as a peacekeeper. Um, he's just he's just a phenomenal man. And, you know, he's just a picture of coolness and calmness on the sideline. And yeah. I think that was... Uh, that was a part of the, the, the reason why Dublin were so successful under him. We might come back to him in just a moment, but your list so far is Paul McGrath, Jim Gavin and Michael Carruth. I know, Phil, you've got to go and do a bulletin, so uh, we're going to just have to kill the tension just for one moment here, Stephen. If you might quickly reveal your final name so we can get Phil's change. Um, Podrick Harrington. Podrick Harrington. We'll come back and give Podrick Harrington all the credit he deserves in just a moment. But, Phil, you do have the, the very quick decision to make here between uh, making a change or not. The, the list do I have is strong. to make a change? Because it's hard to... Like, I, I had, you don't have Harrington, to, no. Harrington was nailed on for me. Um, okay. Paul McGrath was nailed on for me. Jim Gavin, I mean, he's won five All-Irelands in a row. Obviously, um, you know, he, he, he won he won six. But um, the... Uh, yeah, you, you can't leave him out. And then the, uh, so we, we went with Michael, Car- Michael Carruth. Yeah, so I, I actually, like, myself and Steve will get along. So it was always going to be, you know, we, we kind of have to, like, when it comes to sport, we have a lot of the same um, thoughts, even about when we're looking at football, we'll have a lot of the same thoughts. So it's probably no surprise that we're, we're fairly uh, unanimous with our, our decision. Um, because we'll, obviously we'll be we're, fraternity or the rugby fraternity probably won't be happy. Phil, no, really. well, I mean, Johnny Johnny Sexton deserves a, a serious shout out. Obviously, you know the, you know, he would have probably a lot of people would have thought when he wins the senior cup at St Mary's in two thousand and two that that's it, like that is <laughs> the peak of it. I mean, how can you how can you follow that? But then obviously, turns out, um, he, he goes on to have and he's still playing. Obviously, has an unbelievable career. And I was at the game in two thousand and nine when he comes on for Contepomi and. You know, you often I, I often wonder what would have happened that day if Contepomi didn't get injured. Would first of all, would Leinster have gone on to win the game? Because obviously, you know, Contepomi had had a few tough afternoons against Munster, but obviously Sexton comes on, and, and that was you know the start of it really for him. And uh, he's had an incredible career. As I said, he's still going. He's won four European Cups, Six Nations, three times. Obviously, a Grand Slam, World Player of the Year. So, the only the only thing he hasn't done is is get a, is a World Cup. And obviously, you know that's something that unfortunately all Ireland teams have uh, have failed to do. But Johnny Sexton definitely deserves a mention. Tony Ward, mm. you, know, mm. play, you know, obviously an Irish international. Played in that Limerick team on their own hand as well that won the FAI Cup. So I'm always in admiration for lads that would try their hand at a few different sports. I know Steve was mentioning Kevin Moran, but to yeah. go different shape of ball altogether. Well, that's um, that's hugely impressive. I I think Kevin Moran is the the kind of top of the list of omissions here, right beside Johnny Sexton and Robbie Keane here. It's it's an unbelievable selection, <laughs> but. Uh, Phil, thanks a million. I know you've got to go do the J yeah. job. We let you drop out of the call, but it's yeah, all right. Thanks, guys. You've done a great job here, Steve-O. There's been no disagreement whatsoever, and we've <laughs> usually had a bit of uh, disagreement. So let's just go back to Paul Drew Carrington then. He is your final uh, pick on this mountain. What was the thought process behind him, and why did he stick out ahead of the rest, ahead of the other footballers, ahead of the other GA people, and ahead of someone like Ken Doherty and Johnny Sexton? Yeah, like, uh, Ken Doherty is another one I'm, I'm really... I'm... Uh, I'm, just, I'm a bit heartbroken after he came off because I'm, I would have been a big snooker fan as well growing up over the years and I would have started off as a snooker fan back in the 80s um, and watching the likes of Alex Higgins and 
Steve Davis, uh, Stephen Henry, Jimmy White, all brilliant. And then all of a sudden we had this Irish hero, Ken Hardy, coming onto the stage. And, you know, he got to um, two world finals in the end, but 1997 winning that uh, final against Stephen Henry, the, the greatest player that ever played the game. And um, oh, just, you know, again, one of these kind of guys that he did it for Ireland on the world stage, really inspirational man, um, a lovely fella to boot as well. And, you know, his homecoming as well is one of those kind of moments as a, as a, as a young fella. I was a little bit older, I was about 17, I think maybe when Ken won the, the world title, but his homecoming was another one of those kind of memorable days as a, as a young sports fan. And uh, he got, uh, he, you know, he went out old, on the old Trafford pitch as well. He's invited over there with his, his Crucible trophy. And, uh, yeah, it, it feels a little bit... Um, a little bit wrong to leave him off the list, but there's just so many that you, and you can't you fit can't them all on. Them yeah, well, this is, and just before I mentioned Patrick Harrington as well, Eamon Cochran was another name that mm. kept getting fired at me last night as well. And like, what a what an incredible man uh, Eamon Cochran was. Again, looks before my time, so you know you're kind of you, you know of his achievements, but even just going back and reading about him, the chairman of the boards obviously he was nicknamed on because he was he was hugely successful as a as an indoor runner. Um, he won fifty two of his 70 races at 1,500 metres uh, and one mile from 1974 to 1987. That's just phenomenal stuff, really, isn't it? I think he broke the mile record three different times. Um, he was unlucky at two, um, two Olympic Games, but he, got, uh, he finished fourth at two Olympic Games. But he did get that World Championship gold medal in 1983 in Helsinki. That was probably his, his greatest achievement. And, you know, I know there'd be a lot of people out there would be probably of a certain generation, maybe a little bit older than myself, and probably be a little bit angry that Eamon Cochran's been left off the list, but uh, he de definitely should be in the conversation. Maybe if it was somebody else, they'd, they'd have him on there, but look, Potter Carrington, um, we know we know how competitive uh, golf can be, um, how tough a sport it can be. I have to, <clears throat> excuse me, I have to admit, I'm not like the biggest, I wouldn't be like Nathan Murphy, Joe Malloy kind of golf fan, but um, I would be somebody who gets interested when the majors are on and that's where where Paul Carrington excels. Um, I think to to achieve what he achieved, which is to win back to back Open Championships, um, like that's just phenomenal. And in between it, then to win another major, he also tied fifth, I think, wasn't it, in the Masters as well? Um, and just I suppose he's one of those guys that he, he kind of he put Ireland on the map when it came to golf. Um, I feel bad because I'm, look, like I said, because I'm not a golf aficionado, I can't speak um, as well as maybe uh, a golf nerd could about Porter Carrington. But I don't think anybody would argue, um, anybody from Dublin would argue about having him there. Like he's a rat barn of man, never forgot his roots. Um, he's a, a really nice fella as well. I think uh, he's one of those names, a bit like Paul McGar and, and the likes of uh, Kevin Moore and these guys who people would speak quite affectionately about when it comes to Dublin sports people. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I so said, look, we, we've seen other great golfers in the world have won the Open Championship. Um, it's the greatest golf competition of them all. Some say, some argue maybe the Masters, but to go and win that back-to-back, -back, um, that success he had in those 12 to 18 months was just absolutely incredible. And, and to, you know, to remain at the top of his game and to have the nerve to do what he did um, I just yeah, he's he's a phenomenal guy and definitely should be on that on that Mount Rushmore. I'd be I'd be killed, wouldn't I, Owen, basically if I left him off. If an Irish person has three majors, they're in contention for the national Mount Rushmore. Never mind half of their city's Mount Rushmore, in my <laughs> opinion. So I think Roger Harrington personally has to be there. It's quite the task you had, Stephen, I must say. Like I'm just looking at the, the list of people who aren't on the list. Jim Steins, Ken Doherty, Johnny Sexton, Kevin Moore, Robbie Keane, Bernard Dunn. Damien Duff, Eamon Cochran, as you say. Like, I mean, yeah. this, is, uh, this, this is making a case that perhaps uh, South Dublin certainly has a, a bit of strength over its North Dublin compatriots if, if you were picking a mountain. Would, would you go that far that it is the better side of the city? Ooh, um, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, like, I suppose from a football point of view, like, I, I, I think John Giles would have been my, my leading football uh, but, candidates on the, the north side. Let's talk about that for a little bit. Just mm -hmm. like, like, t Tomorrow morning now we're going to have the overall at uh, Dublin, Mount Rushmore and we've got two footballers coming in from the north side. We've got Liam Brady and, and we've got John Giles. 
are you a Giles over Brady person if, if you had to pick one from from those two? Yeah, like um look, I did, again a bit like um Eamon Cochran a little bit before my time maybe and I wouldn't have seen him in action. Um but I know talking to my dad, uh, he would have gone to Ireland games in Dalyman Park back in the fifties and sixties. Um and he just said John Giles was one of those players that just lifted the crowd. Everybody wanted to go see John Giles playing football. Um, he said he could hit a hit a pass from a corner flag at one end of the field onto a uh, sixpence down the other end of the field. He was just an incredibly, incredibly talented footballer. I know he's got a, um, a reputation for being a, a bit of a hard man, but my dad said watching John Giles play football was just one of the greatest things ever. Um, I think he won 59 caps, I think it was, in the end. Which again, for a man in those during those years, I think it was from 1959 to 1980, was it? I think he played. So, like that was a, again an incredible achievement to get that many international caps, and um, winning, winning two league titles with Leeds United um, at a time when you could argue it was perhaps maybe more competitive, you know, a lot more teams maybe competing uh, around that time. He won FA Cups with Manchester United and Leeds United as well. And um, again, with the FA Cup was a, a much um, much more highly respected competition maybe than it is now. People kind of forget that. Um, and then he played in a couple of European Cup finals. Um, or sorry, he got beaten in a European semi-final against Celtic 1970. Played in the final then. Um, unlucky not to win a European Cup, perhaps. The referees um, are mentioned in this context. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, John Giles, like he's just... Like, there's no doubt, Liam Brady is incredible, incredible... Uh, Footballer was an incredible footballer, and he did it in a couple of different countries. Um, and again, when you watch the old clips of him, what a player! Like fantastic. But I just think John Giles, he's he grew up in the inner city. Um, he's got that. I suppose he's one of the old-fashioned street footballers. Um, he's well respected in his own, his own local community and the, the the local, or sorry, in the old north side of the city there around Stony Batter and that kind of area. An absolute hero. So um, yeah, John Giles definitely. He's uh, I, I would have him as the the leading football man over there. Very good, very good. So, your final list for Southside is Paul McGrath, Jim Gavin, Michael Carruth and Project Harrington. I'm not going to lie, it's a, it's a fantastic list. If you had to send a message to tomorrow morning selectors that there was one name off that list that you went letting go of, who is it going to be? Oh, I, it's definitely between McGrath and Carruth. I, I, just, okay. I just hope that they take into consideration Michael Carruth's achievement and who he beat and as Phil explained even better than I did, you know, that was a, that was a world champion. That man was at the peak of his game and, and Michael Cruth went there and beat him. Just a local ad from Walkinstown, a great achievement. I hope that's taken into consideration. But I will say as well, you know, Paul McGrath would be on, I, I would even argue Paul McGrath could be the first head on the Irish Mount Rushmore, not just the Dublin one. I think he's loved, you know, nationwide. He's an inspirational character. He's, a, he's an every man, every man, whatever you want to call him. Um, and yeah, Paul McGrath is the one. Well said, Steve. Well done. Uh, congratulations on making it out <laughs> unscathed. Uh, Stephen Doyle with your South Dublin Mount Rushmore. Cheers, Steve. OTB AM's Mount Rushmore. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters.